Good morning. It is my honor this morning to open the celebration for the life and career of Dr. David Richardson. We are hosting this event live for faculty and virtually for everyone else. And please uh, forgive me if this hybrid virtual reality event has any technical glitches, but we're going to try to host this event where we can honor Dr. Richardson um, with speakers from around the country attending virtually and some live. I'm glad that all of you are here with us. Today we have uh, several members of Dr. Richardson's family, uh, Dr. Amy Richardson and her husband David. Uh, Maxine Richardson is here, and Ron Richardson is here as well. Are there any other family members that I missed? Charlie, that's right. Nine years old? Almost nine. Attending his first uh, Grand Rounds conference of, of many to come. You have to get up early uh, pay attention. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. David Feliciano, who organized the literary fest trip for Dr. Richardson that was published earlier uh, this year in The American Surgeon. I sent that out to all of you, the PDF file, if you haven't gotten it and haven't seen it. It was wonderfully done and serves as the basis for many of our talks and speakers that we have today. And Dr. Feliciano uh, is here today live uh, as, uh, as well as other special guests. We've had some time now to um, process the shock and grief of Dr. Richardson's death. Uh, the acute phase is perhaps almost over. And now we have time to honor and celebrate him because that's exactly what Dr. Richardson would want us to do today. So while we're all still sad, we want to celebrate the amazing accomplishments of this man who, who meant so much to all of us personally and professionally was a true giant in the world of American surgery. I'm not going to read his whole CV to you, but just to give you a flavor of what Dr. Richardson uh, accomplished in the world of surgery, he was one of the most prominent surgeons in America, uh, indeed in the world. Uh, Dr. Richardson had one job. He was here at the University of Louisville for 45 years. Um, he was a prolific scholar. He published 375 articles, 58 book chapters. Uh, he was a visiting professor that went at who, who everybody wanted to come visit. Name lectureships are a big thing in the world of surgery, and Dr. Richardson gave no less than 50 named lectureships and a, another hundred virtually uh, uh, visiting professorships uh, around the country. He was longtime editor-in-chief of the American Surgeon. He served as president of the American Association for Surgery of Trauma, the Southern Surgical Association, the Western Surgical Association, uh, and the Southeastern Surgical Congress. Uh, he had longtime service on the Residency Review Committee where he served as vice chair. Uh, long-time service to the American Board of Surgery where he served as chair uh, and he was uh, served the American College of Surgeons and, and uh, we're going to hear some about that later where he uh, was on the Board of Regents and eventually became president of the American College of Surgeons. Truly remarkable accomplishments for anyone in the world of, of academic surgery. I have a few announcements and we have some special uh, presentations today that I want to, uh, that several will be making, but I'll, I'll start us off. First is to announce that like the Yandel Lecture, one of the, one of the premier visiting professorships that we hold each year, became hyphenated to include Dr. Polk's name. The Griswold Lectureship, which hosts one of the leading trauma surgeons from around the world each year, 
will be renamed to the Griswold Richardson Lectureship in honor of Dr. Richardson's accomplishments. Secondly, I'm not sure that Dr. Richardson ever got one of these. The julep cup is the traditional graduation gift for our chief residents. And since Dr. Richardson didn't complete his training here, I'm not sure that he ever really got one, but everyone here has one. And posthumously, Dr. Richardson will have traditional julep cup. Third, the library, the main conference room teaching center in the Department of Surgery, long named the Hagen Library, which everyone here knows, is going to have a new name as well. It is now the J. David Richardson Memorial Library and will be forever. So everyone who walks in that room, everyone who walks through the lobby, of course, will know, see Dr. Richardson's picture, and everyone who ever trains and learns at the University of Louisville Department of Surgery will learn in the Richardson Library. And finally, from the Department of Surgery, the highest uh, award that we give is the Samuel Gross. If you'll remember, Samuel Gross was the father of American surgery, who was the second chair of the Department of Surgery starting in the early 1840s. His happiest 15 years were spent here before he went on to Thomas Jefferson University. And in his honor, there are many things in American surgery named after Dr. Gross, but uh, some people don't know or forget that he was longtime chair at the University of Louisville. He was number two, I'm number 16. We tend to stick around for a little while. The Samuel Gross Distinguished Career of Service Award comes with a medallion with the likeness of Dr. Gross, handsome man, if I do say so myself, and engraved with Dr. Richardson's uh, information on the back. It comes in a lovely wooden box with red velvet that is on back order because of supply chain issues, but will be here <laughs> and will be delivered uh, to, to the family as soon as it is available, Dr. Richardson. Samuel Gross Distinguished Career of Service Award recipient. Um, I will extend apologies for President of the University of Louisville, uh, Dr. Neely Bendapudi, who uh, had something come up and is not going to be able to be here to attend. And I will invite Dr. Hiram Polk to uh, give some remarks about Dr. Richardson. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As I don't um, ever do, I'm going to read this because we had a special relationship. I want to cover some things most of you don't know. There have been a profusion of tributes from surgery and interestingly from national horse racing bodies, much greater than for surgery. Many more things. The nicest thing you might read is Dr. McMaster's eloquent article in, in the Jack Ready Little Medical Society bulletin this week. It, it talks about a lot of those things. Rather than repeat the narrative of these many things, I want to focus on some early parts of David and Suzanne's lives and careers. Uh, the emphasis of those early years, they were married early, both bled blue from the start. The fledgling, fledgling University of Kentucky Medical School was just opened its doors. He became, they became a very important part of an amazing experiment. Ben Eisman, the, he was an HMS graduate of 15 years before me, and then he had also trained with Dr. Graham at Barnes Hospital. Took up the first chair of surgery at the University of Kentucky and, um, and began to assemble a remarkable academic all-star team in Lexington. Dr. Eisman, Frank Spencer's chief of cardiac surgery, Ben Rush, a great 
surgical oncologist who was uh, Suzanne's boss. She was his secretary. Uh, Rennie Mengi, Lester Bryant, and many others. Suzanne, as I said, was Dr. Rush's secretary, and David was all alone as the only medical student in a quickly building surgical research lab. I first came to know of him in 1970 as a highly productive senior resident in general in thoracic surgery at the University of Texas, San Antonio. He had planned, uh, he had followed another Eisman protege there in Kent Trinkle, longtime person, and built a friendship with Brad Oust that lasted a lifetime. Uh, it was much later that he and Suzanne learned that I had fallen under the Eisman spell, too, in the spring of 1946. Dr. Eisman in those days did a real visiting professorship, which was four days in honor of Dr. Everett Graham, which I've done, was his mentor. I was the chief resident at the time and got to know him. And I guess my career in academic surgery was set, sitting on the steps of St. Louis Maternity Hospital on a sunny afternoon, and he told me why my only choice for my life was academic surgery. <clears throat> what, what doesn't matter a lot is I accepted a job as, as a chief resident in cardiothoracic surgery for Dr. Spencer in Lexington to begin July 1st, 1965. I received a call sometime, sometime in that year from Dr. Eisman. I was, I was ecstatic about what I was doing, and Dr. Eisman thought, I've, I, I'm sure I've got this correct quote. I lost another fight with the dean this morning, and I'm leaving. He said, Frank is going to NYU in Bellevue, and he wants you to come there and be his chief resident in cardiothoracic surgery. Sort of for the maybe the only time in her life, Wanda said no. So I then found a job by looking with Charles Eckert, another Graham protege in Albany, and uh, Isidore Cohn in New Orleans, and Dr. Warren in Miami, who had also trained at the Barnes. Uh, it came across in a, in a remarkable way, so I quickly sorted out a job and went to Miami instead of uh, Lexington, and especially instead of, instead of New York. Uh, Dr. Warren had an interesting position as chief of surgeon in the hospital. He'd been born there 40 years before. Does he like to say, I was here before any of you? <laughs> and that's a, a nice way to do that. Um, when I came to Louisville in early in August 1971, it was then new to the state system. It had lots of money to spend. It had a very old Louisville General Hospital, and the new hospital where we stand here was 10 years away. And it was always going to be the next year phenomenon. By the time David and Suzanne came to interview, and that was sort of turned out very well because Ms. Hargis and Ms. Richards and their, mar their parents really helped. They weren't happy that they were going to be wearing red rather than blue, but they were happy to have them back in Kentucky, and that worked out very well. Um, <clears throat> and interestingly, you know, what David did in his time here was that paper he wrote about what a trauma surgeons do in the daytime is probably one of the most significant. And his one job at the university was to be director of the University Surgical Services at Norton Hospital. And he made that work better than anyone. And when he joined the faculty here, we had a collection of pretty, pretty reasonable people. Louis Flint, Robert Fulton, Cal Jones, Kirby Bland, Don Fry, and Neil Garrison. And David moved right into that and became incredibly successful. In some ways, he might have been the most ideal junior faculty person I ever had the pleasure of working with. My biggest problem with that group of seven of them was to keep them from competing with each other. Uh, I tried to point out that they, they compete with other departments of private practicing surgeons in town, but stop competing with each other. And I think it, their careers, the way that all turned out, is really important. I want to make two very poignant exchanges. One was Suzanne in the summer of 1985, and she said we were somewhere alone, and she says, you know, you've done what Dr. Eisman wanted to do. You built a really great department of surgery. And I said, well, you know, you all have had a big part of that, and that's what it is. Um, in those poignant things, uh, sometime early in August of this year, David said what Dr. McMaster said early in his introduction. He says, you know, you gave me the only job I've ever had. And I said, I didn't give it to you, you earned it. And I recall his, and my response was exactly that. I didn't give it, you earned it. Um, as we left Saratoga a week or so later, he always would call and say, travel safely. 
I have a little cough and I'm going to check myself at a small Saratoga hospital. I pointed out that Albany Medical Center was 30 miles away and that may be a, been a better idea. Uh, as he was often prone to do, he ignored that kind of advice. Um, be that as it may, I think there's only one thing I can tell you about that none of you will have shared or know. The times we shared in 1984, 85, and 86, and 1993, 94, and 95. At that point, we could, it was before computers were real, and I think the two of us probably knew more about horse racing than anybody in the world. And we thought we were on top of the world. And we had the marvelous experience with two race mares, Mr. Revere and Northern Emerald, were the kind of horses that made us cry, sometime out loud. Uncommon speed, agility, determination, and bravery beyond, beyond the description. Every Saturday was the holiday, and every Sunday was pure exultation. There were two special parts of two shared lives, and David was the most special man, and I will never forget sharing all of that. There are lots of surgeons and things, but what we shared for those, those four or five years were simply unbelievable. And that's a tribute I think he would want to have as much as any. Thank you, Dr. McMaster. Next, I would like to invite uh, Dean of the School of Medicine, Dr. Tony Gansel. Thank you, Kelly. Well, it's my honor uh, to be able to uh, present to Dr. Richardson's family uh, the award that he received um, for a lifetime of excellence and service. This is the highest award that we present to our faculty. Um, we were planning to uh, present that this fall. Um, he, he won this award this last year. Uh, obviously, we weren't, we weren't able to do that, but we would love to, um, uh, for his family to have it. Uh, David was such an amazing faculty member and an amazing man. Just brilliant, talented surgeon, a skilled educator, absolutely staunch advocate for students and residents, just an amazing um, mentor, was also my next door neighbor. And I treasured so much our driveway conversations. As a matter of fact, something came up a couple of a couple of weeks ago, and my first thought was, "Oh, I got to go have a driveway talk about that." And then it was, "Oh, wait." And and I just I I miss him. I adored him, and felt really privileged to to be able to share in his life. And um, and Maxine, we've loved you know watching David and Maxine on their walks throughout the uh, neighborhood. It was just um, we really have have enjoyed having you there as well. Um, Amy, I remember you as a medical student, <laughs> um, and it's just, it's really been a pleasure to watch your professional and personal growth and your beautiful family, and um, the Richardsons are very, very special um, uh, to us. David was an absolutely amazing man. I can't think of anyone more deserving of this beautiful award. I guess we didn't have supply chains um, uh, issues because we do have <laughs> we, this is a, a, a medallion. This is on behalf of the entire University of Louisville. It's a trustees award, and we just can't think of anyone more deserving of this award. So it's our pleasure to be able to, um, uh, to give this to the family. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dean Ganzel. It appears that you stole the red velvet box that I needed for the Samuel Gross Award. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, the CEO of U of L Health, Mr. Tom Miller, and to follow uh, close behind him will be our uh, Chief of the Division of General Surgery and Chief Medical Officer of University of Louisville Health, Dr. Jason Smith.
Thank you, Dr. McMaster. Um, I only knew Dr. Richardson for about three years. I had no gray hairs then. And, and I, I will tell you that as a hospital, there is no doubt we're better off by having a relationship with Dr. Richardson. And, and I want to just say a few words, and I'm going to introduce Jason. One was Dr. Richardson was respected by his peers. Not everyone can say that. He was appreciated by every nurse that I've come across. And that's a very strong statement to say. And he was intimidating to hospital CEOs, which <laughs> may be a good thing. And I'm going to give you one quick story of the last interaction I had with him, um, which was he came to me after the medical executive committee and said, Miller, when are you going to build my doctors some beds? And, and that's a pretty strong statement to say because many of his doctors did not have the ability to have patients in the hospital because we were full. And we're going to be announcing in the next few weeks a 90-bed expansion of University Hospital. And I will tell you, Dr. Richardson was a kick in the butt to make it happen, so I just can't say enough for you. But I would tell you, overall, he was loved by all. And, and that's a great thing for a hospital CEO to do. And he's made a long-lasting impression on this organization. I'd like to call on Jason Smith to come up because uh, the board has made a decision to, uh, on behalf of Dr. Richard. Well, thank you all, and I uh, appreciate uh, a moment to say thanks to the family and friends we have gathered for this. Obviously, uh, Jay David meant a lot to me, uh, second father to me once I came down here. So um, it is my honor to be able to announce, um, and I'll read this off, um, from the U of O Health Board of Directors. Uh, Dr. Da J. David Richardson was a uh, native of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, a faculty member of the University of Louisville for 45 years, passed away in September 2021. He served the University of Louisville, a University of Louisville hospital as the Beryl L. Abrams, MD, endowed chair, chief of surgery, and vice chair of the Department of Surgery. Whereas Dr. Richardson was a consummate surgeon and physician, whereas Dr. Richardson was one of the few quadruple boarded surgeons in general surgery, thoracic, vascular, and surgical critical care, and an established prolific career of exceptional and innovative clinical care and service to the community of Louisville and the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Whereas Dr. Richardson was a prolific scholar, consummate academician, and published more than 375 articles, 58 book chapters, and delivered no less than 50 named lectureships while serving as a visiting professor at 98 institutions. Whereas Dr. Richardson's scientific contributions to the field of surgery have shaped both national and international practice. Whereas Dr. Richardson was a thoughtful servant leader whose guidance was sought by numerous academic organizations, he served as president of the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, the Southern Surgical Association, the Western Surgical Association, and the Southeastern Surgical Congress. He served on the Residency Review Committee for Surgery, was a longtime director and chair of the American Board of Surgery. He served in numerous capacities on the American College of Surgeons, eventually becoming the chair of the Board of Regents. And in 2015, Dr. Richardson became the 96th president of the American College of Surgeons. Whereas Dr. Richardson was recognized both nationally and internationally for his clinical care, his research, and education, he was a tireless advocate for the institution and touched the lives of patients as well as his students, trainees, colleagues, and friends within the Commonwealth and throughout the world. Now, therefore, with thoughtful praise and admiration, we, the Board of U of L Health formally recognize Dr. James David Richardson by establishing <clears throat> the uh, J. David Richardson MD Trauma Center at the University of Louisville Hospital. And so we're going to name the Trauma Center. <laughs> so over the next few years, as we expand the hospital and build uh, what he helps establish, We'll be able to formalize this and make this more of a part of what we do every day. Uh, he helped build the house uh, that we practice in, and it's our honor to be able to do this for him. Thank you all. Thank you, Jason, and thanks, Tom, and thanks to everyone who helped to make that happen. Now begins the uh, hybrid portion of our presentation, and I see Dr. Doctors uh, Patricia Turner, uh, who is the executive director elect of the American College of Surgeons, 
as well as Dr. David Hoyt, who is the executive director of the American College of Surgeons. And I would invite you both to uh, provide comments uh, about Dr. Richardson and, and his contributions to the college and uh, more broadly to American surgery. Uh, Dr. Turner, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share a few short thoughts with you all this morning. Uh, good morning all and to the Richardson uh, family. You have uh, my deepest condolences and remain in my thoughts and prayers. Um, I first had the opportunity to meet J. David in 1998 when I was the second surgery resident selected uh, to join the ACGME's Residency Review Committee. Um, it was there, as I sat in awe of the surgical giants in the room, that I learned firsthand several things that would remain themes for him throughout the next 20 plus years that I would know him. Um, he was a prolific scholar, a fearless advocate for general surgery, and a champion for the student of surgery at every level. Um, he was kind and gracious to me, um, a complete nobody, a terrific leader on the RRC, and unfailingly fair and equitable in his treatment of programs and of people. Um, as has been mentioned earlier, he rose to the role of vice chair of the RRC. I learned from him the way to review programs, the way to make sure that we continue to center the teaching and training of surgery residents in this country and the impact that that would have on our career going forward. On a personal note, during my time on the RRC, um, I had my elder daughter, Jessica. And I brought her to one of the RRC retreats when she was a toddler. Uh, she and Jay David bonded um, at that retreat and for the remainder of the years that I knew him, he always took time to ask me about her, ask me how she was doing and wish her well. Uh, she is 22 now. I would encounter J. David over the years at meetings at the Southeastern Surgical, at the board, um, and in other settings, but re-encountered him in a deeply connected way when I became staff of the American College of Surgeons in 2011. By then, he had moved through the leadership of the Board of Regents to assume the position of chair of the board. In that capacity, he had changed for the better some elements, large and small, um, about the efficiencies of our work. He, would all, he was also instrumental in the establishment of our new, at that time, advisory council focused on the rural surgeon. He never strayed from his focus on teaching and training and encouraged the ACS to maintain its role as leaders in the training of America's surgeons, from residency through early practice um, and to utilize the wisdom of our senior surgeons. Our meetings were always made more interesting by his colorful and illustrative uh, animal metaphors uh, and as was appropriate, he very soon was elected to the role of president-elect. And even though his illness kept him from some of the travel that the ACS president often did, he continued to lead ably and effectively and to be a warm and charming ambassador for the ACS and for the field of surgery. During my time at the ACS, I had the pleasure of being invited to give a lecture in Louisville, and Jay David and I had an opportunity to meet during that visit, and I had the pleasure of hearing his sage advice on many items discussed, the state of American surgery, uh, the direction of the American College of Surgeons, um, what we should do about recruitment and retention in the division of member services. And I am pleased that over the years, we had many conversations about these topics and many more, and he was unfailingly generous in sharing his perspective, and he always had an ability to cut to the chase, to the key crux of the matter, and give amazing and always excellent advice. Finally, I had the pleasure of being a witness to his burgeoning relationship with Maxine and was so happy to see uh, their love develop. Um, I know that Dr. Hoyt will add additional reflections, but please know that the American College of Surgeons, all of our staff, and all of our leaders will miss him dearly. Dr. Hoyt. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, well, uh, Dr. McMasters has something that I'll refer to in just a moment, but let's just follow up on Dr. Turner's comments. Um, if you look up Samuel Gross on Wikipedia, 
Uh, whoever wrote the piece on Wikipedia refers to Samuel Gross as an academic trauma surgeon. And uh, you know, for somebody that lived over 100 years ago, that that that, that probably that may not characterize uh, Dr. Gross completely or adequately, but it, it certainly shows the legacy that now uh, we honor with Dr. David Richardson. He was the quintessential academic trauma surgeon, and many of the things we're going to hear later this morning will be a reflection of that. I got to know Dr. Richardson uh, through professional organizations, but in particular through the American Association for Surgery and Trauma, because he was the recorder and program chair uh, right before I was. And, and this was probably almost 23, four years ago. And I'll never forget a Saturday at the end of the meeting when he took me aside and he said, you're going to be the next uh, program chair, right? And I said, yep. He said, well, let me show you a few things. And he took out two napkins and a pen, and he basically demonstrated to me how to run the entire program, how to select papers, how to navigate all of your responsibilities. And uh, it just characterizes so many things about Dr. Richardson, his informality, his, his taking the time to do that, and the fact that he could do things like that so uh, effectively, it was so little fanfare. And I, I actually still have those napkins. As you've heard, he, in the college, uh, rose to, uh, through many uh, contributions, he contributed to the Committee on Trauma. He became a, a board member and uh, uh, really represented so many things in American surgery as a board member. And Patricia's alluded to, he advocated for the rural surgeon and brought two practicing rural surgeons before the Board of Regents to hear a presentation that, that, that to this day is one of the most remarkable mornings we had in examining the needs of American surgeons. He then became chair of the Board of Regents. He changed the character of the meetings and then he rose to be president. Of all the things that, that, that uh, we could say about Dr. Richardson. I think what I was most impressed by him over the years was his dedication to education. And it characterizes really his philosophy, I think, uh, for how he felt about his, his humans. Uh, he, he cared for the underdog. He, he served the underserved when he was in the world. He was a champion for that. He articulated that responsibility. And I know from, from talking to many of you, he, he lived that and, and practiced that way in his practice. He also championed the surgical trainee, and he was incredibly concerned that as we changed, as the epidemiology of surgical care changed, that we were creating a, a generation of surgeons that might not uh, be as well prepared as they needed to be. And he really led that charge. It was controversial. Uh, it meant going across other organizations' responsibilities like the board and the RRC. But he basically made us pay attention to the responsibility for training surgical residents. And he framed it very, very simply. He said, can you operate? Are we creating surgeons at the end of training that can operate and care for patients? We started out by doing that through a committee called the Fix the Five, which was really to try and adjust surgical training. He and Dr. Sechtiva developed what is now an annual educational summit in May where we come together with all the surgical specialties, all the boards, all the RRCs, all the program directors to talk about topics in education. We've now had the sixth one this last year where we talked about resident selection. Dr. Richardson, was the, the seminal uh, catalyst for, for that occurring. He was concerned about these, these people finishing training to the point that he established the transition to practice committee and then the actual master of surgery program in the college. And what that did is took a graduating chief resident who was still a little uncomfortable and wanted some additional time and he created the program that is now flourishing in this country 
and gives those those residents an opportunity to transition and emerge with great confidence. And that was again a contribution directly by Dr. Richardson. And finally, about four years ago, he and I were sitting around talking about these sets of problems. And it was uh, really suddenly clear to everybody that we did not have a written document that described what likes we had done with trauma or, or with other quality programs. But what were the expectations of surgical training? The American Board of Surgery had an outline. The RRC had, had their expectations. But nobody had really taken the time to put down on paper what it was we expected a modern resident to be exposed to, to develop, what principles uh, would found their, their professional uh, development, et cetera. And so we sat down and we created a committee to uh, address this. And, and what Dr. McMasters is holding is the, uh, the, the, the manual that is going to be published on December 1st that uh, represents this. And um, I, I was actually uh, writing to Dr. Richardson for a foreword for this book uh, when he, he passed. So we made a decision to actually dedicate this book to Dr. Richardson's contributions, his tradition, and the incredible force he had in American surgery in so many ways, but in particular in education. So. Uh, Dr. McMaster, I hope you guys will be able to find a place for this so, so that every resident that walks in understands just how important uh, Dr. Richardson's contributions have been. Finally, uh, I just want to comment about um, another aspect of Dr. Richardson, which you all know, and you know, I got to know Suzanne and, and the tradition uh, love that, that is so much a part of your department. Maxine uh, was actually working for me, and um, about uh, four years ago, um, I walked into the office one day, and uh, you know, Maxine was in her office. So I walked by, and I noticed this big bouquet on her desk, and I said, "Huh, man, what's going on there?" And so I, I walked in, and, and I'm unable to not sort of tease a little bit. I said, so Maxine, who sent you the flowers? And she just sort of ignored me and figured I'd, I'd go away. And, and I finally did. Uh, but I did that probably prodder a couple more times. So who was that that, that uh, sent you those flowers? So about two months went by, and I let it go. And then I walked by the office one day, and there's another bouquet of roses on her desk. And I said, Maxine, uh, you know, uh, is this somebody new? Is this? Uh, and again, she just ignored me. And 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 so I went home that night. I got home late that night. And as I walked through the door of my apartment, my phone was ringing. I picked up the phone, and it was Dr. Richardson. And I said, Hi, Dave. What, what can I do for you? And his line was, you know those roses you saw on Maxine's desk? And I just started laughing. And uh, David was a true romantic. It, it, it's such a wonderful thing that he and Max found each other uh, uh, in the last several years. And again, uh, just on behalf of the college and, and, and me personally, having been such a close friend of David's, uh, I'm so honored to be able to make some comments today. And Dr. McMaster, so thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Hoyt, Dr. Turner, thank you so much for, uh, for being here and for, uh, for your remarks. Um, next, we have a live presentation from uh, Dr. Philip Burns. Dr. Burns is a longtime great friend of Dr. Richardson and is going to talk about him and have some, some more personal remarks. And uh, Dr. Burns, thank you for, for everything. And we look forward to hearing about Dr. Richardson's life.
Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, and as you said to start with, uh, time has allowed us to let the tragedy that has occurred in our lives uh, abate somewhat. But um, uh, I'm so glad that we have had this time to uh, reflect on David's career. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really privileged to have the opportunity to be here, uh, even though it's a somewhat painful privilege. Um, uh, I, I was afraid that by going in, in the order that we did, that a lot of what I'm going to have to say has already been covered, and, and I, I knew that would be the case. And it has been, so this is going to give me a time to maybe uh, step outside the box a little bit and outside the outline and just tell some stories along the way because some of the uh, objective information has already been covered. But uh, as you said, uh, David and I uh, go back a long way uh, and, and shared an awful lot of things together. Uh, when David Feliciano asked me to write the biography about David for the American uh, Surgeon uh, I had to think of a way to start it um, and thinking about the metaphors that have already been mentioned and uh, issues like that. Uh, I thought about something that actually David and I had talked about a couple of times because our parents had said this to both of us at one time or other. And, and I'm not, I, I will have to say, I, I'm ashamed to admit I don't read the Bible a whole lot, but this is one of the verses that uh, was pointed out to me several times, and that is uh, that if you're given an awful lot, uh, a lot is expected of you. And that certainly was the case uh, with David um, in my mind. And so we started that uh, biography about him uh, with that as a background uh, because uh, he was blessed with a composite of a huge number of things that were uh, gave you an opportunity to be successful in life. He obviously was brilliant. I have no idea what his psyche was, but it had to be unusually uh, high. And if you, yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the family, but clearly there's a gene, there, there's some genes there that aren't so good, but there's some genes there that are really good as well. Uh, he also was a driven individual, uh, as has already been alluded to some by the things that he was driven to do, particularly at the college. He had an unusual passion for everything he did in life. Uh, those, are, I mean, every, you, you guys in this room were around him even more than I was. Uh, and yet he and I usually talked uh, for 30 minutes to an hour every two weeks uh, for the last mm, 40 years or so. Um, a great communication skill, his ability to uh, synthesize in short order uh, issues for people. Uh, and then, as Dr. Polk already indicated, he definitely had a definite confidence uh, uh, in, in what he thought and what he believed. Uh, but it was at times balanced, uh, and most time was balanced with humility, uh, even if he shared that with you personally. And by putting all those things together, he certainly has had a marvelous uh, personal and professional life, uh, as, as, as we all know. Um, and so it's been, it's been a privilege to, to ride alongside him in this world. Now, uh, just for briefly... How did, how did David and I get to know each other? Because I'm from Tennessee and from Kentucky, and it really came through, again, trauma. Uh, he was the state COT uh, trauma uh, uh, chairman for Kentucky, and I was for Tennessee, and this was in the fledgling days of ATLS. We were training people in ATLS, but we were also training people in how to teach ATLS. And out of that came the trauma postgraduate courses. The East grew out of one of those, and the West grew out of another one. Uh, but we presented those papers, and I know David Feliciano uh, was involved in, in several of those as well. So we got to know each other, and we would uh, rub elbows at those meetings. And then, as we did, we figured out that, you know, there was a lot of, we had an awful lot of similar things in our lives uh, to talk about. Uh, one of them was that... Uh, we both grew up in uh, in, in rural America. Uh, I always told him he really was from a big city because the largest town in our county, which is a great big county, had 1,600 people in it. So to me, uh, you know, where he grew up, Moorhead was a great big city compared to that. But nonetheless, uh, we did have that background and certainly an appreciation for it. And our families grew out of 
that rural uh, background as well. Um, we both were products of public education completely. Uh, elementary school, high school, college, medical school, and then both of us ended up working at public institutions for our whole career, so we shared that. We had an unusual passion for medicine and surgery, and I'm throwing medicine because both of us pretty much felt that you ought to be a doctor first and then a surgeon, uh, and so we did that. And focused uh, our careers really on how did a patient do, uh, not so much, certainly was not us as a center or you as a fellow medical colleague as the center of activity, but how did the patient do? And if you start there and back up, you can't help but be educated. If you start to educate around how a patient does, you can't help but do research. And in the world that we've had, at least in the business of medicine lately, you made a pretty good living doing that too. And so we had that, uh, we had that in common. Uh, and then, Turns out we both were born into the livestock industry almost um, and certainly shared that uh, and I'm going to talk a good bit about it since so much of what I have to say going forward has already been covered. Uh, uh, me and the beef cattle industry from the time I was nine years old borrowing $500 and buying steers and from there on I've owned cattle all my life and David from the time he was real young buying part of a horse and, and, and going on from that point on. Uh, he introduced me to the, to the horse racing and horse wreck breeding and, and going to races, and I introduced him to what a good bull looked like. Uh, and then throughout, and then along that way, we ended up with our wives having unusual cohesion. And I say wives, I mean uh, both his wives and, and my wife. So that's a picture of David and I, and you can see that one of the spires there in the background. So this is, uh, he's, he's kind enough to host me uh, for the last, uh, I've, I've missed only two uh, Kentucky Derbies since 2000 uh, as a result of his generosity. I mentioned the cohesiveness of our families and the fact that our wives liked each other. This is a picture from the Southern Surgical when David was the, was the, was the president. And if you look here, this is my wife. Uh, and if you notice, those are his racing silks. Um, my wife had that made into her uh, formal dress for that evening and wore it in his honor, and so uh, we did a lot of things like that together. Well, what about David and his, uh, his life, and maybe a few things that haven't been said already. I, obviously, he was born in Moorhead, and he was the oldest child of uh, William and Lavina Richardson, and so I'm going to digress a little bit and tell you a bit about them. Uh, William uh, was from really rural Kentucky, what they call the head of the holler. And for those of you who don't know what that is, the head of the holler is so far away you can't get to town unless it takes in less than half a day. Uh, and sometimes it takes you a lot longer than that. And uh, so he, as a result of that, and really being born pretty much into eastern Kentucky poverty, only had an eighth grade education. Uh, his, his wife, Lavina, uh, she grew up in Moorhead, and she was a lot luckier. She got a high school education. Uh, he moved to Moorhead just to get a job after the eighth grade, uh, and they met and married when she was 19, he was 17. Right after they got married, or soon thereafter, uh, he volunteered, ended up in Italy uh, during World War II, and during that time is when David was born. Uh, so well, he came home from Italy uh, with a son there. Uh, he came back, went to work uh, for a wholesale distributor, uh, and the company was somewhat fledgling along, but uh, kind of struggled, and finally he bought the company uh, and made it into a very prosperous business, so much so that it became one of the leading businesses in Moorhead. Uh, and <clears throat> when he sold it, he said, I'm selling you the business, but I'm keeping the building. And so he kept the building, and here it is. He and his family uh, donated it to the state, I assume, but it's the uh, uh, Kentucky Folklore Museum uh, and is one of the most visited uh, places for visitors in Moorhead today, uh, and the Richardson family 
donated the building that was the principal side of the of the of the business obviously much larger with warehouses and things during its aggressive time um, having met his parents uh, they were both very intelligent people pretty easy to understand uh, where that gene came from now David like so many members in his family uh, really didn't go by his first name uh, same thing for me, same thing for him, and many other pe people in his family, interestingly. It's James David Richardson. He was always called David, though, just called David in Moorhead, but once he went to medical school, it got changed around, and so just like today, I've already heard him mention him called J. David about 10 times uh, before I got up here, and that's became uh, everybody around the country. When somebody would ask me about how he was from a health standpoint, it's how is J. David doing? Uh, so that's what he's been for all these years is J. David Richardson um, and, as I said, many other family members similarly. He went to Rowan County High School uh, where he was a valedictorian of his class. Um, two of his other three siblings were also valedictorian of the high school class at Rowan County as well. And while he was there, nobody had ever entered the state essay contest for high schoolers, but he decided to do that and won it, um, and that pretty much established where he was. And then the debate team, he got another guy to go with him, and they became the debate champions for, high, for the Rowan County as well, and that had never happened before. Uh, one of the things that would, though, exemplify his personality to some extent, he was a really talented uh, musician, especially drummer, uh, but he got thrown out of the band because he had a fight with the with the band director. Um, so he didn't get to 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 extend that career any. But he did then meet uh, Suzanne Hargis at the time, and then Hiram's already elaborated about some of that. He graduated in three years from Moorhead with, of course, a full. Uh, he had a full scholarship to go there, and he had a near perfect record, but not not a perfect. Uh, in the mid-1990s, he was uh, honored as being one of the all-time great graduates of Moorhead, and this is a, a picture of him receiving that award, and Ron, back, who's sitting back here, uh, was there for that uh, presentation. The two of them were together for an awful lot of things through their life. Uh, David didn't have a perfect 4-0. Ron did. He was the first graduate of Moorhead. He was the first graduate of Moorhead State to graduate with a perfect 4-0 average. Um, right at the end of college, uh, married Suzanne, and they moved on to UK, as, as Hiram pointed out, uh, with a tuition scholarship and Suzanne working for Dr. Rush, and Dr. Rush was always uh, uh, such a nice gentleman to me, and it really was so because he knew I was a friend of David's. Um, he did the first two years of his residency there at UK and then moved on to San Antonio really with Dr. Trinkle uh, and got to be, as, as Hiram pointed out, uh, Brad Oust became one of his mentors and lifetime friends. Residency in both general and thoracic surgery and then quadruple boards, as has already been alluded to as well. I don't personally know anybody or know of anybody who had triple quadruple boards. I'm sure they're out there, but I don't know who they are. Uh, David was one, and he could talk, present papers, discuss papers in every one of those areas, and I know all of you have, have seen and heard that occur. Um, Hiram detailed uh, recruitment of David back here um, to Louisville, um, and I just put this one picture in that was in Bill's uh, uh, paper that he had in the journal. Um, just to remind me to say um, that when uh, when students from Tennessee ask me where they ought to go other than to our place to interview for residency, you need to go to Louisville and look at Louisville uh, because the history of the surgical training here has been exemplary, uh, absolutely. Uh, and the number of great uh, surgeons and leaders of surgery who've come through here is, is staggering. Uh, some of whom already been men mentioned, many of them in the room. So I had a list of them, and I decided I'm not going to mention them because I might exclude someone. But what a great, uh, what a great group of people! What a tremendous success uh, this program has been to the world of surgery. 
So when you look at David then uh, and and try to compartmentalize him, and by the way, he didn't ever compartmentalize much of anything. I mean, you could go from family to horse racing to surgery all in the same paragraph or sometimes the same sentence. And so, uh, you know, just to divide up uh, where where he was, I mean, uh, I think he was a really good surgeon, never operated with him, but I can tell you that first five or 10 years I was here to go to the Derby with him, we'd make rounds uh, at Norton and at university and sometime at Jewish. And the spectrum of patients that he'd walk in to see uh, pretty much exemplified all those different areas that he had that he had his boards in. So I'm pretty sure that he did take care of patients in those areas. And I know from that he was really a surgeon, surgeon to a great extent. Medical students, I can speak to that because, of course, I've been interviewing medical students for a long time now, 45 years in Chattanooga. And we're really pleased when we have kids from Louisville come down there. And uh, uh, we. the interesting thing to me is if I called David about one of them to ask, you know, how would you rank these? He could tell you something about their parents. He could tell you where they were from in Kentucky what their hobbies were, almost without exception, and sometimes he could do that five and ten years after the fact that they that they were, had applied. Even pediatricians in our city who went to Louisville to medical school would periodically stop me and ask me, how is Dr. Richardson? Uh, so that uh, he certainly had a huge impact on medical students, and once again, I know the people in this audience pretty much know that. Residents, obviously, same thing. Others are going to talk about that, so I won't say much more about it. From a faculty standpoint, he's been a huge uh, impact on growing people's careers, uh, and I know in many cases, I mean, it's almost been to the detriment of the department here that you have somebody come along and you do such a good job of promoting them that they move on to something else up the line, in academia at least, and you have to then start all over and, and to uh, <clears throat> start all over with somebody young and develop them as well. And that's been a marvelous uh, attribute to the whole department, and especially to Hiram and to David. And then the others, um, and uh, so that I can sort of digress a little bit here because i got a little bit of time to talk about this since everybody's already talked about some things, but Dr. Hoyt mentioned the napkin that he said he still had. Uh, and uh, shortly after I was, uh, it was clear I was going to be president of the Southeastern Surgical and actually was president of Southern at the same time. And so I was having to work on two presidential addresses, which for David would have taken about, I don't know, two or three hours. Me, it took me two or three months for each one. But uh, Suzanne, Gann, David and I went, uh, were at dinner and he said, what are you going to talk about at Southeastern in your presidential address? And I said, well, I don't know. He said, I'll tell you what you ought to do. And just like Dave Hoyt said, he pulled up the napkin there off, the, and this is the napkin. Uh, and he said, you ought to talk about when you started, uh, and what education was like at that point, and then you ought to show what's happened along the way. And so that's what I did. Um, and uh, because there were an awful lot of transitions that have occurred uh, since 1976 up until the time at 2000 that these things happened. So uh, there's an example of what David Hoyt's talking about. And you saw this occur a lot with other people, and he's done that with a lot of other people across the spectrum of education and, and surgery in America. Now, he was not shy about getting into controversy, as most of you would know. And Jason and I were talking about this last night. Um, uh, I've forgotten, I think it was Jason told him, I don't know Frank Miller who ever uh, explained to him that after university had been uh, co-opted by the Kentucky One, and uh, I was familiar with the CEO, by the way, of the hospital over there in Lexington, plus she had been in, in our community for a while, so pretty much knew what that was being run like. But at any rate, they were saying that things were going bad here, that we didn't have enough nurses for trauma patients and what have you, and so David took it upon himself, and this doesn't project well, I realize, but I, I had to insist, to my, it's okay. The people in the audience will know, but this is the front page of the Courier Journal, where he had sent an email to one of the to one of the uh, journalists there that uh, it wasn't safe to be a trauma patient at university anymore, uh, and put his name on it, 
my version that I know is after he sent that, he went down to Kelly and said, you know, I'll resign if you want me to because this could end up being controversial, but it didn't, didn't matter to him. And as I understand it, uh, out of that came uh, a change in the ownership of the university and to cut to the chase. Uh, we now have an independent uh, university uh, program, uh, health system again. Uh, and I know this probably wasn't the only thing, but it sure one of, was one of the things that got it started. And so he, he was not afraid to do that. The, the triple threat part or the quadruple part, I've already dealt with the surgeon, doctor, researcher, educator, uh, but leader is headlined here because I thought I would make a few more comments about that. And once again, a lot of that's already been uh, mentioned. Uh, obviously, he was a leader here in Kentucky with the Com Committee on Trauma and uh, later became president of that group and then was appointed to the regents uh, in uh, 2005. I happen to remember that because there were some vascular surgeons that didn't want him appointed to the regents because he was appointed actually as a representative of the vascular surgeons and not trauma, by the way. Uh, but uh, cooler heads uh, prevailed and uh, we had a lot of late night phone calls to different people about that uh, and he was appointed and obviously had quite a tenure with multiple committees during that time. Uh, just a couple of ones that really made a difference. The F Street was something, the F Street building and the fact that we needed to have a presence in Washington as a college of surgeons uh, to, in, to influence healthcare and advocacy. Um, he was strongly for a member of that committee and helped get it done. Finance, on the other hand, Board of Regents insisted that we needed a retirement program for surgeons and we should support it. And he said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Surgeons already have, surgeons already have ways that they're investing their money and they're not going to do it. Uh, I can remember he and John Cameron having heated arguments about this. Well, turns out David was right. So that's just two examples of things of committees. Uh, again, it's already been mentioned, uh, the rural surgery part of it, uh, this is something that uh, he and I talked about for years. Uh, he changed the agenda, brought two rural surgeons in to make a presentation to the Board of Regents, and then he appointed, he said, I think we need an advisory council for general, for rural surgery. And by the way, that was the first new advisory council that had been established at the American College of Surgeons in 43 years at that time. Uh, so again, it was an example of looking to what the country needed, uh, needed surgeons uh, in rural areas uh, sensitive to that issue. And I can tell you, this is one of the reasons that I say he's probably the most recognized surgeon in the American College of Surgeons or probably in the last 30, 40 years, is I can tell you every rural surgeon in America knows who David Richardson is. Uh, he appointed me to be the vice chair of that committee uh, just so that we would have a presence there. And so I know that from talking to an awful lot of them. So, so that was a huge step forward for the American College of Surgeons and for, and for, the, for health care in America, uh, in my opinion. Um, the TTP program has already been discussed. That grew out of a discussion that one of our faculty had with a resident at one point, and I won't belabor that at this point. but. That essentially what we decided was we needed to have essentially something that the College of Surgeons could dictate how it was run, as opposed to, uh, I guess I can say it, Dean, the ACGME uh, with all their rigid rules. Uh, and we really needed a, a postgraduate opportunity for people who finished programs but didn't, weren't really ready to go to Moorhead and practice general surgery. And so that's essentially what that program, just, and it's been a good development. Actually, after it got started, several members of the Board of Governors, they had to cut off discussion at the, at the clinical congress at the Board of Governors meeting because there were a lot who said, why don't we do that with everything in surgery? Let the College of Surgeons run it all. So I leave that bit with you. I think it still would be a good idea. Uh, and that grew out of our experience with the two of us were on the RRC together and we had to deal with a lot of the dictums that came through that uh, as well. Uh, the future general surgery training again came out of the fact that we were frustrated with what we were seeing with graduates, and I say we, things we talked about. 
the Fix the Five didn't do much of anything. They then, he and David Hoyt then created a committee that had representatives of all the, of the program directors, ACGME, um, Board of Surgery, <clears throat> and uh, started looking at the future of general surgery. And then what really happened is a lot of the other surgical specialties found out we were doing that in general surgery and said, why don't we have a, why don't we all get together about that? And out of that has grown this summit on surgical education that's held every May and every by the leadership of all the surgical disciplines come. And it's a fantastic thing to be a part of. And I've been blessed to be there just because I was around these guys and they said, why don't you come along sort of. Uh, and so it's been a real privilege to see that develop. <coughs> well, this, uh, Going back to the college, uh, at, at, toward the end of David's tour on the Regents, uh, I was asked to, by several advisory council, to write his nomination letter uh, to be president. And this, I obviously can't read it, but it went real long. And I said at the end, you know, it's, uh, it's really not possible to describe Dave Richardson anything other than a long letter, uh, but that the college would be so much better off uh, if we did uh, pick him as the president, and we did, uh, thankfully. And uh, as has already been alluded to, his health limited somewhat his activities, but uh, he did get to do some things. This is a picture on the plane on the way to Dubai, which, of course, as usual, he was there and made presentations to their scientific organizations, but also managed to go to some horse races. <clears throat> Scotland, uh, he was able to make that trip. He and Amy uh, went on that trip together and he uh, again represented the college at their uh, College of Surgeons meeting. The other things have already been alluded to, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of his leadership and Board of Surgery, the RRC, and all the places that he's been president of. And as of course, as you would expect, he was not, he was not a caretaker president. He, he actively uh, contributed something to what he thought needed to change or be modified in their, uh, in their programs. The visiting professorships, I've made this point before, even at the time of his, his funeral, that uh, somebody ought to look at it. I'm, the named lectureships now that I can find are 45, and I'm pretty sure there are a couple in the last year that have not made that list. Uh, if anybody's given more named lectureships than that in American surgical history, I don't know who it would be. And the same thing for the visiting professorships. Well, as far as the horse racing, uh, you know, what Hiram had to say about the personal side of it, uh, I got to see it by him taking me to the Derby and to Saratoga and to the and to Belmont at times. But he grew up in it just like I did in cattle, and he studied every part of it. He, he knew a lot about how to feed them, how to groom them, everything else. Had ownership early uh, in horses. <clears throat> and I'll show you this picture here just to show you how happy he could be uh, when he won a race uh, along the way. So I don't think that comes as any surprise. He had a special relationship with Woody Stevens, who was a legendary uh, trainer. Uh, here you see David with Woody, uh, and he had that relationship from childhood as Woody was a cousin of his mother. Uh, he, um, th th the Stevens did not have any children, and so uh, both David and Ron were the closest thing to children that they had, and David in particular was like a son to Woody, uh, is my understanding. Um, and yeah, here's Woody, who, among other things, is uh, he's still legendary in horse racing in that he won the Belmont five straight years at one point, which never had occurred or probably may not happen again, I don't know. Uh, same thing with Bill Mott. Uh, Bill Mott, uh, of course, was a longtime trainer, started out young, was the youngest member to ever be elected to the Hall of Fame. This is a picture uh, back in 2019 when the country house had won the Derby the day before uh, the morning, Sunday morning after that, you have sort of an informal um, news uh, conference. Bill had talked to all the news people that were there, uh, all the major networks, ESPN and so forth, and the first person that he walked over to talk to when he finished was David Richardson. I took this picture uh, of the two of them talking at that time. Afterwards, David, by the way, gave a 30-minute interview to an ESPN reporter who was trying to make a big deal out of the fact that we'd had an awful lot of injuries to horses racing in California that year. And, 
I know if you read the, <clears throat> if you read the Blood Horse, you know about that. Another person is Bill Landis. Bill is the uh, manager of Hermitage Farm, and uh, they have a special relationship. And I've been really privileged to get to know Bill through through David. Uh, and Bill and I now are very close friends as well. Lanny Cornhorst. I wish I had a picture of Lanny, but what a character he is, and he kind of kept you up on what was going on on the backside at all times. And then everyone else on the backside, Wayne Meredith tells, tells a story about going back there with us to, on the backside on Thursday. And David kept mentioning there, meeting everybody. And Wayne said, uh, David, do you know everybody back here? And he said, uh, most everybody. Of course, there are thousands of people back here. Ron was with us. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, yeah, and he said, yeah, and he said, well, what about that guy right over there? And so it was one of the stable hands, and David looked at him and said, Pedro. Pedro said, oh, doctor. And so he comes running over, pulls up his shirt, and shows the incision where David is operating on him. So <laughs> Meredith told me that story. Uh, and then he's on this, uh, he's a U.S. representative on an international racing uh, uh, committee. The backside healthcare, I think everybody knows about that, started the clinic for that, that that has been extrapolated to a lot of other places. And then, I'm telling you, he was something as a handicapper, as was Suzanne, by the way. Uh, they kind of helped me along the way. And I can tell you that usually four out of five years, I make my walking around spending money that my wife lets me have comes from the Derby uh, and uh, how well we've been able to do that. Briefly, family. This is a picture of Suzanne, uh, Suzanne and David, uh, and then how proud they are of their children. Uh, this is Suzanne and Amy uh, a few years ago, uh, but equally proud of everybody and especially uh, grandchildren here for the five grandchildren that David uh, especially proud of. And then his siblings, Ron, Paul, and Barbara, who unfortunately died young of a radiation-induced uh, cancer, uh, but this is Ron. Ron would be David's best friend and probably his best referring doctor, gastroenterologist here, but a uh, picture of them at the horse races as well. Nephews, nieces that he took on trips to in the summer uh, to extend their knowledge. I know they came to Chattanooga and spent one week one time and brought them up to the farm so they could see some cows and bulls and, and things like that and then the extended family that he's known through those. Um, and then, of course, uh, Maxine Rogers. Um, unfortunately, Suzanne had bad health for the last 10 years of her life, uh, died uh, at Saratoga as well, uh, uh, unfortunately, in the same ICU unit that David died in, by the way. Uh, but then he was fortunate to, uh, in his grief and depression, have good sense enough to come out of that, uh, develop a relationship with Maxine, and God bless you, Maxine, for what you did for him. So, there's the picture of them, uh, and allowed us to still enjoy the Derby together. I think that's the picture, again, from 2019. From a health standpoint, that Richardson gene, not so good, uh, particularly in terms of blood clotting and spine issues, and, uh, and that led to near-death experiences for David uh, two times in 2010 with a saddle embolus and then 2015. I came up a lot of times in, during that time and it was really bad. Uh, but somehow or other he lived through it uh, with uh, massive uh, blood transfusions as well as exposed uh, metal uh, from his uh, spine surgery. Um, and then, of course, COVID that has already been alluded to by, by others that uh, led to his uh, demise. Well, I just hope wherever he is, he can walk down a lane like this and get to look at a horse. Uh, sorry for the abbreviating a lot of that, but uh, it's been a real pleasure to have a chance to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Burns. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Uh, David Feliciano to the podium, who's uh, going to have some 
remarks about Dr. Richardson and his uh, influence in the world of trauma as well. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kelly, for the kind invitation to speak. And uh, best wishes to the family and the Maxine. Thank you for being here. Before I start, the place that I currently work is the world famous shock trauma center at the University of Maryland. It's an institution that's completely dedicated to the care of trauma patients. And on a given year, we'll admit between six and 7,000 trauma patients. Tom Scalia is the um, director of the shock trauma center, personal friend of mine the man who rescued me from retirement, frankly. Excuse me, can you get this more? Slides, that DL thing. Thanks. And I asked Tom to uh, say a few words and I'm conveying them today. I first met a young Dr. David Richardson in 1983 when I interviewed for fellowship. That began a 38 year fellowship. I visited Louisville a number of times. Our practice styles and values were quite similar. When we agreed, we did it with a huge amount of respect. In our recent last conversation, we remarked how we were dinosaurs as general surgeons. We were quite comfortable with it as we took pride in operating directly and emergently all over the body. The entire faculty at Shock Trauma joined me in sending our most Sincere condolences to Dr. Richardson's families at work and at home. I already miss my dear friend. We were all better for knowing him. Which button is This is a test to see if I've memorized the presentation. I've got another port. Will that work? Would you like me to share my screen and you can just say next slide? Sure. Can you get rid of the uh, little picture again? That's just the front. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I'm gonna speak about my personal friendship with Jay David. I'm gonna mention how this literary fest shrift in the American Surgeon came to be. And honestly, most of my comments will be about uh, my personal time with David. Next slide, please. We were friends for 38 years and I even remember when I met him at the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma meeting in Chicago in 1983. It's a long time ago, but he was a giant in our field even then. And it was interesting what a magnet he was when you went to a professional meeting. That was still true the last time I saw him at a professional meeting during the past year. He was an academic mentor to me. I've had a nice surgical career in uh, working in academics but I can't tell you how many times I called David when I was struggling with an issue to get advice from him, frankly. Some of them are very personal. Next slide, please. So when 
David stepped down as former, as editor in chief of the American Surgeon, which is the in-house surgical journal for the Southeastern Surgical Congress, the largest regional surgical society in the United States. Next slide, please. Oh, they're not changing. Okay. Um, I guess the audience would need to see them. You just want to be displaying the blue jean screen in the room. The local screen. So again, the Southeastern Surgical is the largest regional surgical organization in the United States. And it's interesting because it has membership that includes academic surgeons, as well as many rural surgeons in the Southeast. Next slide, please. After we put together the fest drift, I got a call one morning from the new editor of the journal, Don Nakayama. And he said, did you write an introduction? I said, no. I said, I thought you were going to write the introduction. And in two hours at my desk at the University of Maryland, with no notes in front of me, I was able to write this because it sort of summarized uh, the amount of time I'd spent with David and how much I knew about his career and how important he was to uh, that particular surgical organization. Next slide, please. This is Don Nakayama, uh, obviously uh, laughing at one of David's comments. These are the last two editors of The American Surgeon. Uh, David was a, a very proactive editor and conveyed a lot of that to Don, who's been a very effective editor to date. Next slide, please. So Don, Don uh, called me one day and said, you know, we ought to do something for Dave Richardson. And he said, can you arrange some kind of a fest shrift, uh, sort of a going away party retirement for J. David? So I wrote to Kelly, who I've known for many years, and I just asked him, I said, is there any chance the University of Louisville will be doing sort of a retirement for David? I thought this was a polite thing to do, and I, again, Kelly, I knew would probably be doing something as well. Next slide. Well, in my enthusiasm and with my aggressive uh, personality, I actually sent a plan for a formal feshrif with people coming in from all over the country to honor Jay David and present papers. And because I'm a sports fan, and I'm not sure Kelly remembers this as part of the feshrif, I included the attendance for all participants at a University of Louisville football game. Next slide, please. Well, there were two problems. Uh, one, somebody was going to have to pay for this ceremony, and I didn't bother to contact anybody to find out who had the money. And then, of course, Jay David said no. He said, I'm not retiring. I'm transitioning. Next slide, please. So I wrote him this email, a uh, so-called counteroffer, and just at the bottom, uh, or the first sentence is, you know, the journal would like to dedicate part of a future issue to a series of articles by your friends and colleagues reviewing some of your scientific contributions over the past four decades. I thought that was a polite way to offer the counteroffer. Next slide, please. And he was very crisp in his return. None of this is necessary. And I said, yeah. He said, but I actually don't have any objection. And then fortunately forgot completely about it. Next slide, <coughs> please. So it was very interesting. On a Saturday morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, when you get to be my age, you don't sleep as well. I'm sure people in my age group can relate to that. I got up and went to my home office, and I went through my files. And in 30 minutes, I had 10 papers by J. David from my own files that I thought were really great. 
And he was either author or co-author, and these encompassed a 35-year period of his career, major scientific publications. Next slide. So I called faculty colleagues, some of whom are in the room, former fellows and friends, and said, would you review one of David's old papers and tell me if it's still valid, if you will. Next slide. So I was uh, assigned myself an article on trauma, and this is uh, the title of the article's at top. And Dr. Richardson reviewed more than 500, that's his quote, articles on hepatic and splenic trauma. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna summarize that article in this one slide. At the last paragraph of the paper, many of the questions and controversies on management discussed by J. David have been resolved over the past 15 years regarding hepatic trauma and money, many unfortunately have not splenic trauma and the trauma surgeons in the room can relate to that. Next slide. <coughs> David didn't even know about this as I mentioned because in his inability to figure out how to get paper copies of the journal that he was editor of for 15 years get sent to him he couldn't figure it out. So he never saw this wonderful issue. And in May, I got this email, which really touched me. And you can read it yourself. Um, he didn't know about it. He felt badly that he didn't know about it. But then when he finally saw it, he got very emotional. Next slide, please. And this, he sent me some very personal comments. And the one that I found most intriguing was, having known you for close to 50 years. So that would make David and myself about 90 years old. So he, he sort of exaggerated the length of our friendship, but I was honored by that. And then the dots refer to some personal comments about our friendship, which I really treasure. Next slide, please. I'd like to finish up with some personal observations and reminiscences. Next slide, please. He was a surgeon, surgeon. People relied on David here and elsewhere for advice. Next slide, please. I had a patient with a gunshot wound to the distal esophagus, unusual injury. It was a mess. I took it out and I stapled the top end and I stapled the lower end. And my upper staple line leaked and the drainage made the posterior mediastinum a cesspool. So I got on the phone with one of the two people I would call during my career for advice, Jay David, and the other one's my current boss, Tom Scalia. I said, D D uh, David, what do I do with this terrible situation? Next slide. And his first response with his usual attempted humor, <laughs> have you read the paper that I wrote with Bill Cheadle in 1982 before surely some people in this room were not born? And I laughed sort of. I had a catastrophe in my hands, and then he gave me some really sage advice. It was, it was vintage Richardson. Next slide, please. He was incredibly bright, as Phil said, and well-read. You don't get to pass all those exams to become bored in four specialties without knowing a lot, again, as Phil said. Next slide. Unfortunately, he was one of the, next slide, two most dreaded discussants of trauma papers at scientific meetings over the last 40 years. For the members of the audience who are not familiar with the uh, one other person on the slide, this is Basil Pruitt, who for many years was a colonel in the Army, ran the U.S. Army Institute of Surgical Research in San Antonio, the famous burn unit, and a brilliant, brilliant man. And the other dreaded discussion, as I'll demonstrate for you, was J. David. Next slide, please. So let me give you an example of a discussant, discussion, excuse me, of a paper at a surgical meeting by Dr. Pruitt. A formula that provides the basis, and you can read the rest of this. Basil was a statistical scalpel. No matter what statistics your local university statistician put in your paper, Basil could find fault with it. Next slide. The audience response, and I'm very guilty of this, was what does this mean? None of us could understand what he was saying. 
I don't know, but Basil said it, so it must be true. And he went through his whole career like this. We never understood his discussions. They were very brilliant, we assume, but that's the way it was. Contrast that, next slide. Jay David, legendary. J.A. David slowly walks to the microphone to discuss a professional paper. There's a mischievous smile on his face. And all of you who know him know you can relate to the last statement. He uses his right hand to hitch up his pants when he gets to the podium, right? Just same time, same every time. Next slide. That's at the Southeastern Surgical. Next slide. Now I want you to read this carefully because David was known privately as the Velvet Knife. Discussing another person's paper. This is a brilliant paper, exceptionally well written, and I recommend that you all read it. Unfortunately, the author's methods are flawed, their conclusions are erroneous, and their discussion is drivel. Next slide, please. So the younger members of the audience, the one half, after David stepped down from the podium would say, did he like the paper or not? They were totally confused. And the older members of the audience who had gone to many meetings with David quietly stated to themselves, the velvet knife strikes again. Incredible. Next slide. He was a surgical statesman, uh, as again, Phil alluded to. Next slide. If you're on the boards of surgical societies where there's a lot of people who are hyper-aggressive, ambitious, and a fair number of them have chips on their shoulder for reasons that I, a psychiatrist could explain, there's three groups. They're thoughtful and experienced leaders whose opinions are sought and respected, J. David, the prototype. There are ambitious individuals whose comments follow and mimic those in group one, you all know those. And then there are the timid or bored individuals who never speak. This is true for all the societies, the Board of Governors, the Board of Regents, everything. Next slide, please. We had a meeting of the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma Board in 2001. And as many of you know from J. David and Frank Richardson's paper, the future of trauma looked pretty grim. 95% of trauma in the United States is blunt trauma, not guns. A lot of those people don't require a general surgeon's operation. They go to orthopedics or neurosurgery. So we were having trouble attracting people to the field. We got on this bandwagon, let's change the name of our journal from the Journal of Trauma to the Journal of Trauma and expand it to acute care, emergency room type of surgery. There was great enthusiasm at the board meeting. I mean, I was there. And it was so typical. David, what do you think? And he just went totally against this. I mean, everybody was, let's change the name of the journal. David said, it's way too soon. We haven't really established acute care surgery as a specialty. Authors around the world will not understand which journal is which. The journal citation will change. We'll have to notify every library around the world at medical centers, and it will cause confusion among readers. And it was so typical that when David finished speaking, the idea was dropped. It was a millisecond. I swear, it, it threw me, because I had seen his power before, but this was extraordinary. Next slide, please. He liked to talk. You never had a short conversation with David because it, it, it wasn't that his mind wandered. He just had a lot of things on his mind and he was conversing in many. Next slide. So my wife is a past president of the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma. And part of her presidential address was about leadership. And she surveyed prominent surgeons, if you will, a third of them were past presidents of the AAST. Some were past presidents of the college. Dave Hoyt, obviously, was uh, uh, surveyed. Frank Lewis at the American Board of Surgery and two deans of medical schools. It was a pretty heady group. They had 1,800 years of leadership and clinical experience. Next slide. The interviews were very structured 
and when they were scheduled for 15 minutes. They range from one individual who spoke to my wife for eight minutes on the phone and one individual who spoke for 51 minutes. Next slide, please. Steve Shackford, former chairman of the uh, Department of Surgery at the University of Vermont. A very dear friend. Next slide. Next slide. He actually prepared his answers and forwarded them to my wife via email, so the interview is token. Eight minutes. Next slide, please. The longest interview for all these individuals with Jay David. Grace, Grace and I loved David, and Grace got off the phone and she said, I couldn't get off the phone, he just wanted to talk. So, next slide, please. He was very convincing. I mean, you, you, many speakers have already alluded to that. The question is, was he a matchmaker? Next slide. My wife is a professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins, just stopped doing clinical work in July. Has really had a nice career and is one of the nicest people on the planet, frankly. Next slide. My wife and I are not senile. Maybe I'm a little, but we're pretty sure that we met at a meeting of the American College of Surgeons in Chicago in 1991. I mean, we both think this. Next slide. For some reason, several years later, J. David came up to me and he said, you know, I introduced you to your wife. And then he did the same thing to her. And then every time he saw us at a professional meeting, he said, you guys are so lucky that I introduced you. Just, he said, just incredible. Next slide. So he's so convincing that Grace and I just finally gave in and we tell all our family and friends that J. David introduced us. We don't have any idea if this is true or not, but I didn't want to hurt his feelings. He's an honorable man and he's pretty sure he introduced us. Next slide, please. I can tell you at the Southeastern Surgical after we published the report of, of J. David's passing, I was privy to all the emails we got from our members and it was incredible. Um, I don't think there was one email we got where they didn't mention the word friend. Everybody was David's friend. People who didn't know him were their friend. And it really, it struck uh, those of us at the surgical group that we had really lost somebody, as I said in um, one of my comments, that we don't think can be replaced. There are giants in all professional fields, but some of those giants are so important to the field that it's hard to believe they'll ever be replaced. And that's sort of how I feel. A great friend, a true giant in our profession, and a wonderful human being. Thanks for the privilege. Thank you, Dr. Feliciano. That was fantastic. And I would just say, knowing that uh, David's memory was so incredible, if he says that he introduced you and Grace, I am fully confident that he did, because he remembers things and details that that uh, that I, I am all, have always been in awe of his ability to remember such things. Next on the program is a virtual presentation from Dr. Uh, Lewis Flint. Dr. Flint, are you on this video conference somewhere that I can't see? Ah, let's see if we can get your presentation up and see and hear you. Again, I Dr. beg Flint? your forgiveness. Dr. Flint. Uh, you, you, still have your, you still have your microphone muted, yeah. Dr. Flint. Yeah. There we go. I'm... The the picture of the television next to the microphone is the way to share your screen.
Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can hear and see you. We do not see your presentation. I, I don't have any slides. Oh, okay. Then you're good to go. <laughs> well, thank you, Kelly. It is an honor to participate in this celebration of the life of a great surgeon and friend. I hope you all will forgive me for the facts that these remarks are more sentiment than science. Some of these items you have heard in other presentations. By way of background, while caring for injured soldiers in the 1968 Tet Offensive in Vietnam, I decided I wanted my academic surgical career to focus on trauma and critical care. I was trained by leading trauma surgeons, Curtis Arch, John Moncrief, and Max Rittenberry, and completed a trauma fellowship under the guidance of C. James Carrico and G. Thomas Shires. But I did not want to be compartmentalized as solely a trauma surgeon. I wanted to be an accomplished, broadly experienced surgeon. In 1975, I was privileged to be invited to join a department of surgery that provided the perfect environment to achieve those goals under the leadership of Dr. Hiram Polk at the University of Louisville. In 1976, shortly after Dave Richardson joined the faculty, the department moved to new office space and we were assigned offices next to each other. Over the course of nearly eight years, we worked together to improve trauma care in Kentucky and along the way became a very productive academic team. During our time together in Louisville, we also developed a close and lasting personal relationship. Our families bonded and our daughters became close friends. Our main purpose was to achieve the primary goal that Dr. Polk espoused, become master surgeons. We started in the Louisville General Hospital a true charity hospital with dark ORs, crowded ICUs, and open wards. Worked with a great team of colleagues in emergency medicine to trauma center. After moving to the new university hospital building, it became the first American College of Surgeons verified level one trauma center in Kentucky. We also worked in the community hospitals that were close to Louisville General because Dr. Polk believed that providing excellent patient care in varied clinical environments was a key part of being recognized as a surgeon. Dave was the best example of the success of Dr. Polk's philosophy. He was clinically excellent and his main goal was to provide the best patient care. Dave's approach to clinical practice was based on a four-step process experience, learn, create, improve. He would live a clinical experience, learn from it, then create a solution that improved outcomes for patients. Once the process was complete, he gathered the data and published it. Dave Richardson was a consummate Kentuckian. Born and raised in Moorhead, Kentucky, he received his undergraduate degree from Moorhead State University. He graduated from the University of Kentucky School of Medicine began his surgical residency there. During his medical school years and after he began his surgical residency, the Department of Surgery was a very productive academic unit with faculty members such as Ben Eisman, Frank Spencer, Ben, ben Rush, and J. Kent Trinkle, all of whom would become national leaders in academic surgery. Dr. Trinkle, a central figure in the development of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery at the University of Kentucky Medical Center, became an important mentor for Dave and stimulated the career-long interest in thoracic injuries that has been a central feature of his surgical identity. Of interest, more than 20% of Dr. Trinkle's 156 peer-reviewed publications deal with trauma to the thorax or the pathophysiology of lung injury and shock. Dave Richardson is the lead author or co-author of a large proportion of this group of papers. After the beginning of Dave's residency training, Trinkle was recruited to the Department of Surgery at the University of Texas, San Antonio by the chair, Dr. Brad Aust. Dave left the University of Kentucky to follow his mentor and joined the residency in San Antonio and completed his general and thoracic surgery training. Dave spent his entire professional life at the University of Louisville where he became a critical resource for surgical patient care and surgical education. At the same time, he has risen to national leadership in surgery. His love of Kentucky was manifest in his loyalty to the University of Kentucky sports teams and his devotion to the breeding and training of thoroughbred racehorses. 
It was through Dave that I became acquainted with thoroughbred racing. We had great times going to the races at Virtual Downs and Keeneland. I can tell you that there were days when we were fortunate to have paid the parking fee before we entered, before entering the track grounds. If we had not, we would have been walking because we finished the day financially destitute. On the other days, I marveled as he won $10,000 or more. Thankful that our friendship lasted nearly 45 years and continues now as a treasured memory. I am deeply honored that handwritten notes, emails, and text messages he sent to me often contain the term, my brother, in the salutation, closing, or both. Throughout his life as a surgeon, Dave Richardson was dedicated to the improvement of care for the injured patient. The article that is the subject of the review I did for the American Surgical Festschrift is an early example of the central philosophy of his approach. The report on first rib fracture provides a clear snapshot of the state of injury care in the mid to late 1970s. Surgeons were seeking ways to identify patients who needed early and effective interventions to control bleeding, improve oxygenation, repair visceral injuries, and control the risk for complications such as post-injury infection and organ failure. Imaging using computers, computerized tomography, ultrasound, and magnetic resonance technology was not available when this article was received and written. Also, angiography was not widely used to diagnose injuries other than those involving the cerebrovascular structure, and angiographic therapeutic interventions were mostly in Ongoing hemorrhage from internal injuries of the thorax and abdomen were diagnosed mostly by monitoring clinical signs, drainage through thoracostomy tubes, and the use of diagnostic peritoneal lodge. Trauma surgeons vigorously searched for markers that could be found on clinical examination and, and, and typical x-rays to uh, guide decision-making for use of surgical procedures, admission to critical care units, and interventions such as ventilator support. Demonstration of the associations of first rib fracture with high impact injury mechanisms, increased mortality, increased risk for major vascular injury, and pulmonary morbidity constituted an invaluable contribution to the knowledge base of trauma surgery. Richardson and co-authors reported a retrospective analysis of data from a cohort of 55 patients who received care over a 10-year interval at either the University of Kentucky Medical System or the Bexar County Hospital in San Antonio. The article stressed the fact that the anatomic location of the first rib protects it from fractures due to less forceful impacts that often cause fractures of ribs located more superficially. Thus, discovery of a first rib fracture identified a patient who had been subjected to high energy transfer and was at high risk for requiring operative intervention and or critical care. In this clinical series, the most common mechanism of injury was a motor vehicle crash. Two of the patients were struck by motor vehicles. One was injured in a fall, and the final patient was the victim of a lumbering accident. High energy transfer was evidence and produced clinically significant brain, chest, abdominal, and long bone injuries in the majority of patients with multi-system involvement in nearly all. One third of the patients required exploratory laparotomy and significant visceral in in injury was identified in all but one of this group. A significant thoracic injury consisting of unilateral or bilateral Pneumothorax, hemothorax, or pulmonary contusion was present in 35 patients. Ventilator support was needed in 20, almost 25% of patients. Cardiac injury, hemopericardium, or cardiac contusion was diagnosed in eight patients, but none of these required operative intervention. Overall mortality was 36%, with traumatic brain injury being the most common cause of death. Long-term neurologic morbidity included Horner syndrome, brachial plexus injury, and thoracic outlet syndrome. In the discussion section of the article, the authors supplied a clear review of pertinent literature that confirmed the association of first rib fracture with high energy transfer and severe cerebral thoracic and abdominal injury. The increased risk of missing an abdominal injury was noted in careful surveillance of patients with first rib fracture to minimize the risk missed injury was encouraged. 
Richardson's article prompted a careful examination of chest x-rays in all centers to discover first rib fractures in patients who had involved, involved in blunt force trauma, especially motor vehicle crashes. This report, report was written while Dave Richardson was completing his training in thoracic surgery. When he arrived at the University of Louisville after completing his residency training, he already had nearly 60 peer-reviewed publications. He rapidly became the academic surgery role model for medical students, residents, and faculty. Being able to have him as a friend and colleague has been the single most important feature of my professional life. I will continue to be grateful that I was granted this honor and privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Flint. Um, I've uh, been instructed that it would probably be a good time to take a brief intermission for about five minutes, and uh, and we will resume uh, in uh, after a quick quick break. Those of you who are on the line waiting to present, uh, please bear with us. All right, everyone, we're going to get back to the program. If I could ask everyone to take their seats once again. Our next uh, speaker who will be attending by video conference, Dr. David Livingston at uh, Rutgers, who's going to have some comments about Dr. Richardson and about chest trauma. Dr. Livingston, are you there somewhere? Yes, I, I am, I Kelly. A little picture. Um, looking for the share screen bit, which I can now see. Here it is. Perfect. There. We Let's see, see if it you. works. Look at that. Everyone see that? Looks yes, good. we can. Thank you. Okay. Well, Dr. McMasters, Dr. Polk, Dean Gansel, who I remember from being a superb otolaryngologist when I was a fellow. I am so honored, so excited to come back to my academic home, albeit virtually and hopefully soon in person. Um, Couple of comments before I start. Uh, this is uh, David and I. Uh, when he and I, uh, as an associate member, was uh, installed as the Academy of Master Surgeon Educators, and as you heard, there's no doubt that David was a Master Surgeon Educator on so many ways. Um, to the right, uh, your left, uh, is uh, the Louisville Blue Trauma Book. Uh, and you can see Dr. Flint, Dr. Richardson, Dr. Polk's name on it. It occurred, came out when I was a fellow between 86 and 88. And although he didn't really want to, I made him sign the darn thing. Uh, as you can see, just as I was leaving Louisville in the end of June in 88. Uh, classic Dave Richardson fountain pen, classic handwriting. Um, and, uh, it, you know, he had more confidence in me of being a future trauma leader than I did, which is another classic David. Uh, and uh, have a small part of my education. Small part, yeah, right. We all say that's, it's all about, um, for David, it was always about you, it was never about him. A um, <clears throat> little bit, uh, and I'm honored also to have Kentucky in my roots, uh, as Dr. Polk alludes to. Uh, uh, Dr. Richardson uh, was at UK uh, with Dr. Spencer, who was my chair of surgery uh, when I was a resident, and then Dr. Rush, who uh, Suzanne was his secretary and cancer registrar, and Dr. Richardson worked in his lab, became my first chair of surgery, who actually I fooled into hiring me. 
Uh, this is the paper uh, that we wrote together. Uh, I really wanted to do something about this. I'll tell you, this is the paper that I, I did for the Fetch Shrift. Um, and uh, uh, this is the paper that uh, there's a lot of interesting parts about this, and I'll get to how we got to this point. Um, so uh, I came to Louisville, and it's it's been a little bit of a reflection, uh, and it, I reflected on this when I had to give uh, Dr. Richardson's Fitz address at the recent AAST meeting, which uh, is going to be published this February and the February issue of Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery. I believe the FITS is online. I'm not going to reiterate some of what I said there. But when I came to Louisville, I, I was the first modern-day trauma fellow. In, in retrospect, I think I was, I was the first clinical fellow in the department. This department was a general surgery department that believed in training broad-based general surgeons, and they didn't have fellows. So I came and I didn't quite realize how daunting the whole thing was, but I knew I wanted to work on a project with Jay David. Uh, and I knew it had to be good because he wouldn't tolerate any less. And, and, and as a trainee, man, you just didn't want to disappoint him. I mean, it was like trying to just, you know, you, it's like disappointing your dad, you know, you did not want to disappoint him. And I was always interested in thoracic trauma, partly because I came from NYU, which is cardiac surgical Mecca and, and I also under the spell of Dr. Armory's Hood, uh, who finished his retirement career there, who was also a master thoracic surgeon, trained with Hayden in Ann Arbor, and was uh, had a huge practice in Austin before he came to New York. And I didn't actually realize that outcomes and survivorship would be a current theme in my career. It turns out in this paper, but but because of that, it's also as as I believe Dr. Burns mentioned in his talk. For David, it was all about how the patients did. Even if you could measure something maybe that was not quite right, but if the patient felt fine and did great and returned to their life, that was what it was about. So I simply asked him a simple question about chest trauma patients, which was, how do you think they do in the long term? Uh, I came to him one that afternoon, you know, as we did. Uh, Dr. Malangoni's office was next to his. Dr. Miller's office was there. We're in, and really, Dr. Cryer was still uh, was there in between doing his PhD, uh, Dr. Garrison. And, uh, you know, these afternoon conversations, man, they they there was at least a do dozen or more papers that came out of these. And that was only in my time. And he said, in typical fashion, I don't know, but I think they do pretty well. And he took out his index cards. And again, if you remember that. He always had index cards about all his patients. So we embarked on this study. I we had a prospective group in the short term. We we just kept taking people with bad chest trauma. We ended up with 28 of them over my time because I had to get this done in a year and a year and a half. I'm I convinced someone to do serial PFTs, uh, and I think he arm twisted them as well. There's no doubt that as you heard, David could be convincing. And we decided they shouldn't have a brain or spinal cord injury because that would just interfere with everything. And then we went back into the whatever registry he had and trauma, uh, and we, we pulled out a whole bunch of patients that were 1 to 11 years post-injury. And we got them to come back, and that was a fascinating conversation, which I'll mention. And we gave them a questionnaire uh, and whatever. Remember, this is 1987, more or less. And here's the patients, and they're a pretty hurt group. Uh, 28 in one group, 13 in another. This is from the paper, and they're pretty young, pretty classic trauma patients, although some of them are yeah, a bit up in age, uh, mostly men. But there was a fair degree of females because of a lot of this was blunt trauma for most of them. As you can see, motor vehicle collisions and, and motorcycles. And the mean ISS is 34. So this, as I said, this is a pretty hurt group. So here's the data from the paper, and lo and behold, early on, patients do pretty terribly. They're kind of, their FEV1 is low, and their uh, their MV, uh, MVV is low. But you can see it kind of gets better pretty reasonably in, in about a year, year and a half. And, and it's kind of plateaued between the 18 months and 36 months. Uh, and I didn't realize the significance of these two 
sort of plateaus. And we did get a bunch of people to come back. I mean, even though we had 28 in the first group, I, I managed to convince almost half of them to come back in a year. So pretty good. And they, they did get better. And, and when I spoke to these people on the phone, it was fascinating. Now, this is, remember, before cell phones, before emails. I know the, the younger people in the group can't believe this. Before the Internet, you know, this was, you know, you had to get people on the phone, and some of them didn't have answering machines. And Anyway, um, and I, I actually spoke to them for a long time, a lot of them. And, and most people did pretty well. A couple of people were smokers or had COPD, and obviously they didn't do quite as well. Um, ch severe chest trauma is not a plus in that group by any stretch of the imagination. And in the prospective group, the interesting thing was, you know, I asked about pain, and it, it was miserable, but it got a lot better pretty quick. And by six months, people were doing okay. And we kind of came out with the conclusion, the paper, was that long-term disability was somewhat uncommon. And this was a little bit in contradistinction to a paper that Tom Cogdell wrote with uh, uh, Landers Kaffer, uh that basically identified that there was long-term disability. And uh, I will say that their paper gets quoted more than ours. Um, I'm not certain they're right. I'm not certain they're wrong. I think we're looking at two sides, and I'll explain that as we go. Pain, uh, but we did identify something, which was that you really need to wait 18 months. Now, this is the ninth conclusions in 92, so this is 30 years ago. And I think we really haven't learned that very well. Uh, but Tom did comment on the paper when I presented at the AST meeting, and he said, well, you didn't do exercise testing. Had to give him that. We didn't. I was lucky to get it back for static BFTs. I didn't, we couldn't even conceive of doing that. And again, there was probably a little bit of inclusion bias, and, and this is written in the Fetch Shrift. And, and ARDS, you know, was not defined, although these people were pretty hurt. So I think that's okay. Um, clearly, the patient report outcome measures weren't even, <laughs> even thought about back then. And, and so um, I probably could have done a much better job there, and maybe we didn't ask the right quality of life issues. And, and I, I would give Dr. Cogdell, who's been a friend and colleague for 30 years since, um, we didn't do exercise testing. So what has happened in the 30 years? Well, a lot, <laughs> no surprise. Uh, ArtsNet came out and, you know, because again, for the, the residents and the audience, we would ventilate these people with, you know, eight, nine, 10 cc's per kilogram. So we were probably creating a lot of problems. ArtsNet really changed our management of ventilatory strategy. Clearly ICU care is better. Uh, whether rib fixation matters or not, that's, uh, the whole talk and I'll just leave it alone, but obviously we didn't do that. And clearly uh, more standardized and more um, um, other kind of outcome measures um, are really much more uh, rigorous than they were back then. So does our data hold up, you know, or does this rock just fall down? Well, right after we did our paper. A uh, paper came out in Journal of Trauma a year later, looked at not all that dissimilar group of patients, a bunch of flail chests, as you can see, uh, one to four, 20 patients four years out, so somewhat similar to ours, spirometry, blood gas, chest x-rays, and they did all this. And again, ISS 25, 34, again, pretty similar to our group. And uh, they found that Interesting enough, the group that had an actual pulmonary contusion um, seemed to do worse, and it was somewhat positional. Uh, and the, but the chest roll deformity didn't seem to matter worth a, a darn. Uh, so again, um, and it may be that they thought that these people with bad pulmonary contusions, especially the after then you've overventilated them, ended up with some pulmonary fibrosis, and you you kind of actually lost, you know, just pulmonary parenchyma. And this actually may be what we're sort of seeing in our COVID survivors, where the lung just gets beat up and um, there's actual lung parenchymal loss. Well, a couple of years, uh, you know, 20 years later, um, another paper comes out. Uh, and again, 55 patients that they've studied at six months and 38 at a year. And this one, they did exercise testing. So again, one of the limitations of our study. 
was uh, the six minute walk test. And uh, they've also found that spirometric dysfunction really improved greatly at a year. And there was some limitation in exercise testing, which maybe didn't improve all that much, but it was hard to dissect uh, the author's claim. And I agree with when you read the paper, it's hard to dissect the overall disability from the injury burden that they had from the chest specifically, because these were not isolated chest trauma patients. But, but again, uh, as pointed Dr. Cogdell 20 years before, maybe, maybe exercise testing is the key. Um, on the other hand, uh, when they asked the patients, patients felt pretty good uh, and they showed market improvement between six and 12 months. But again, this, this, they uh, measured uh, kind of bad pulmonary function. The patients who had a uh, PDF ratio less than 200, so maybe these are the ones with the bad contusions or some other issues, ended up having a bit of worse outcome in the long term. But again, chest wall abnormalities uh, didn't really matter, predictive outcome. And, and it again, brings up the whole issue of should we be fixing ribs or not fixing it. Well, paper in New England Journal of Medicine from the Canadian group. And again, they, they, this was all comers with adult res respiratory distress syndrome. But the Canadian trial group is a very, very astute and very uh, excellent group of, of uh, investigators that have done some amazing work over the time. And so they followed about 109 patients with ARDS and, and about a fifth of them trauma patients. And uh, they also did exercise testing as well as spirometry. And the good thing about them, and again, the good thing about Canada is they had 80% follow-up at each time point. And uh, <clears throat> what they identified was what we're starting to see now in our long-term survivors of just critical illness, a lot of loss of body weight. I mean, 20% body weight loss at discharge. Uh, a good third were still uh, somewhat uh, below the below their baseline weight. In other words, they lose muscle mass that they never get back. A lot of chronic pain, heterotopic ossification, neuropathy. And they identified uh, some persistent healthcare problems all along with a fascinating 50% back to work, which uh, that number, if you have been following the trauma outcome game is about what we see in our trauma patients themselves. And, uh, you know, is this the ARDS or is this just severe critical illness is really the, the unanswered question, I think, is what we're, as in critical care gets better, we're having more and more survivors. Well, lastly, uh, another, another study, uh, they followed up that same patient group in, uh, uh, for another year, from one year to two year, and they really identified no further improvement. So that these people following ARDS, at about a year to two years, there was no objective improvement, and some of their subjective improvement was pretty small. So, you know, in the light of time, uh, did our original paper hold, does it hold up our conclusions? I think in general it does. Again, we've all, all of us in academic medicine have written papers that we've looked back on in horror when we read them 30 years later going, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But I, I think this paper of David and I, uh, he was still proud of it. I am proud of it. Proud of the fact that it's him and me together on a one paper uh, by ourselves. Um, it turns out in retrospect, when in the, in the history of the uh, thing, it's actually one of the early papers on trauma outcomes. I mean, there are others, but this one's pretty, pretty in, out there. Um, and maybe we undervalued overall disability, a little unclear. We never considered mental health, I will agree, and that's a big issue right now. And and I, I kind of stand a bit with our chest wall deformity, unless your chest is completely crushed in, it's probably not a big deal as in the long term. I will agree that uh, exercise testing, and that maybe goes along with whether you can go back to work kind of thing, uh, and what kind of job you could do, probably was, uh, it definitely will identify further limitations, whether they're clinically important to the patient or not. I don't know. If you're, uh, you know, if you're bailing hay, yeah. If you're an accountant, maybe not. 
Uh, and I, I probably didn't drill down on the pain issue to the extent that I really probably should have. So in summary, this is on my paper with David. Um, I, I, I thank you so much for being in our lives, my life and my career. And in classic J. David, you made us so much better than we could have ever imagined us to do, which goes along with Dr. Burns' uh, quote from Luke, which I stole for the fits. So uh, once again, thank you for allowing me back to my academic home. Uh, I, I couldn't be prouder of my association with the Department of Surgery at the University of Louisville. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Livingston. Uh, uh, we now have um, three more talks to get through by 10 o'clock. So uh, next up is Dr. David Spain, who's at uh, Stanford University and uh, has a former association with the University of Louisville as well. Dr. Spain, I see your picture there. Welcome. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Dr. McMasters. Um, it's an honor to be here. I will say it's uh, still before the crack of dawn on the west coast here, um, so it's still dark here. Um, much like everybody, I have fond memories of Dr. Richardson. I first met him in September of 1991. Double He was an uh, officer of the AAST. The meeting was in Philadelphia that year. I was a chief resident interested in a career in trauma. And uh, I drove down and had dinner with him uh, at a hotel in Philadelphia. He, up until this year, he, he insisted that he offered me a job on uh, that night on the spot. I tell him, you know, I don't remember that happening, much like the the uh, Feliciano uh, Rosicki story. But he insists he offered me a job on the spot. I insist I would have remembered that and would have told my wife about it. But um, but uh, luckily, I did a few months later decide to come to, to uh, Louisville to start my career. And I uh, was lucky to begin my career in, under the leadership of these two giants. And then really spent my formative years with uh, with these four uh, wonderful surgeons, Eddie Carrillo, who we'll hear from, Neil Garrison, who really uh, taught me a lot about how to think like a scientist and how to try to answer questions and have fun trying to answer them. Frank Miller, as all of you know, a consummate surgeon and educator and phenomenal person. And then much as we've heard about Dr. Richardson, thoughtful surgeon, incredible educator, radical thinker, and probably the most generous mentor I've ever met in my entire life. Well, uh, for the FET shift, Dr. Feliciano asked me to, to review this paper, will future trauma surgeons be interested, or will future surgeons be interested in trauma care? Results of a resident survey. And this was published in, in 1992 in the journal Trauma. And you have to put this in context. So this was, you know, done in the, in the 1990, 91 era. And they sent a paper questionnaire to about 1,800 general surgery residents who were PGY3, 4, or 5. And they received a 49% response rate to an open-ended survey uh, to residents on their interest in, interest in trauma. So it was before the internet, before SurveyMonkey, before Doodle Polls, before any of that. They sent out pieces of paper and envelopes to 1,800 residents and got a 50% response rate, which is just insane. The only way you do that now is, is tying something to the app site. And the, the results of this were really, you know, pretty provocative. So, you know, yes, residents, do you believe trauma is, is an attractive, rewarding career? And they say yes, you know, two-thirds of them. Would you be interested yourself in, or would you characterize yourself as being interested in trauma care to some extent? And sure, 80% said yes. But when you ask if they want that to be a major part of their career, the answer flips and 80% say no. And would you be willing to take take no? That said no. And even of those who said they were interested in trauma care as part of their career, 
only 8% were, would even pursue additional training, such as a trauma fellowship. And when asked why not, you know, what are the negative factors, which were cited about 80 to 1 over the positive factors. You know, there's a lot of work, but fewer operations. Again, you know, the, the changing demographics with decreasing penetrating trauma, the, the development and advent of CT scanning and non-operative management of many trauma injuries. You know, the feeling of babysitting for other specialties like orthopedics and neurosurgery, um, heavy amount of night work, negative patient factors. Again, um, many of these patients are participating in unhealthy activities when they get injured. Fear of infectious diseases. Remember, this was the height of, uh, in the early days, the AIDS uh, epidemic not properly trained economic um, factors, you know, including reimbursement in a patient population that's frequently uninsured, and then malpractice fears, which, you know, honestly are, are probably unfounded when you look at the data, but are definitely real, at least in the minds of the practitioners. You know, but, but more important than this was some of the open-ended comments, and um, most concerning were a lot of comments about the negative role models. Now you also have to understand that a lot of places at this time, the, the trauma service was really an afterthought at a lot of places, uh, not, you know, not uh, an established um, feature like at the University of Louisville. And many of this trauma services were staffed by faculty that really had other career interests that just did trauma care until they built up their private practice and then they left. And so as uh, Dr. Richardson and Miller pointed out, you know, based on the results of the survey, they were concerned. Like who will care for the next, you know, who will be uh, the next generation of surgeons to care for the injured patients? And they really thought we needed to improve trauma training and should make it enjoyable, um, educational, and an opportunity that will appeal to surgeons for a lifetime. Well, as a you know senior resident at the time, chief resident, and somebody interested in a career in trauma, you know, this idea of joining a group that was interested in trying to revamp trauma training was highly uh, motivational and, and was a huge reason for me to come to Louisville. But you know, over the next um, you know several years, multiple papers from UofL really attempted to outline a model for ensuring adequate operative skills were maintained. And because really what we wanted to do is avoid this, right? We wanted to make sure that there were going to be people there to answer the call. And so there are a series of papers uh, that came out of the, the U of L Department of Surgery. This one from uh, a year later, Richardson, Frank Miller, and Dr. Polk talked about models, a model for success. And we're really um, highlighting the benefits of building the trauma program around the foundation of general surgery. And again, Dr. Richardson uh, further expounded on this in the, in the uh, bulletin for the American College of Surgeons. And then really made this a huge part of his presidential address in 1999, you know, being concerned that we were becoming too specialized and that we really re need, needed to return to our general surgery roots. Well, much like everybody else, I had one of those experiences where Dr. Richardson called me to his office and, and told me what I should do. And uh, he pulled out a piece of paper, wasn't, wasn't a napkin uh, at this time, Dr. Burns, but he pulled out a piece of paper and he sat down and he said, e David, you need to write this paper. Should trauma surgeons do general surgery? And I said, yes, sir. And he sketched out the idea and uh, we put our thoughts together, presented this at the AAST in 1999 and published it in the Journal of Trauma in 2000. And really this paper, you know, we, we at the time surveyed the membership of the AAST and 25% of the trauma surgeons in the AAST were doing less than 25 trauma operations a year and less than 25 general surgery operations a year. And we really advocated for this model of uh, broad-based general surgery uh, in trauma care. And so really this sustained effort of, of UofL surgery led directly to the discussions, the retreats, you know, the soul searching that really led to the acute care surgery model. Now, I will say one of the um, big benefits of being the president of AST is you get to invite your fifth lecturer. And uh, this year we had planned to have Dr. Richardson do that. And unfortunately, um, timing didn't work out. I will say that Dr. Livingston did, did a marvelous job interpreting Dr. Richardson's thoughts. 
and he really went through this whole evolution of, of trauma and acute care surgery as a specialty. And while David had a lot of reservations about the nomenclature and some of the focus, you know, in the end, um, you know, he was uh, obviously proud of the fact that the work coming out of the University of Louisville really had a huge impact on the field and has in a lot of ways revitalized our field. And how, why do I say that? Because this is what the data supports. So, you know, you go back to 2005, there was only about 50 or so general surgery residents uh, pursuing critical care fellowships at the time. And this is still, for most people, the gateway into getting into trauma and acute care surgery as a career. So there were only about 50 residents a year going into it, and only about 50% of the positions in the United States filled. Fast forward to, to 2020, we now have um, 142 programs. And we have this uh, 2020, we had 277 residents uh, going into surgical critical care, 22 or 92% of programs filled. So we went from you know around 50% of programs filling to tripling our size with 92% filling. And so the quantity and, and quality of fellows uh, uh, applicants have increased every year. And now we have 29 AASD approved uh, two year acute care surgery fellowships with 66 active fellows. And it's astounding to me that now that 23% of all graduates of general surgery programs are pursuing additional training in surgical critical care. And um, as a, you know, in recognition of this uh, interest in the field, the AAST has started an associate member category uh, really aimed at uh, fellows and junior faculty. And we started this two years ago and now have 369 members, which is about double what I thought we'd have. And this group is highly engaged, very enthusiastic, and has a lot of ideas on how to uh, continue to grow our field. But sort of most heartening to me and most reaffirming is, you know, we've had this huge interest in the field and we really wanted to find out why. So we just simply asked the question of, it, of the trainees for the last couple of years, you know, what has drawn you to, into this field? And um, I had certain ideas going into it and my hypothesis and it turns out I was wrong and, and I'm glad I was wrong. Because if you look at residents today, you know, what attracts them to this field? A lot of the things that were espoused at University of Louisville under Dr. Richardson, team-based care, strong role models, developing a broad skill set, enjoying complex um, problem solving and caring for the sickest patients in the hospital. So to me, this is the, the you know some of the best data I've seen over the last couple of years that we have really revitalized the field, brought in interest, brought in you know intelligent, hardworking, committed surgeons who who want to do the things that we all said we wanted to do when we were going into trauma and acute care surgery, you know taking care of the sickest patients in the hospital. Well, again, this simple you know paper-based survey of 1,800 residents really was the start of a, of a pathway that has, I think, um, revamped, revitalized our field and really driven interest in it. And for all of that, we are yeah, deeply indebted to Dr. Richardson. You know, like many of you, um, it's hard to express what a profound influence he's had on me, both personally and professionally. Um, and I will be forever indebted to him and my experiences at the UofL Department of Surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spain. And to your point, uh, right now at the University of Louisville, by far the most uh, uh, popular career choice among our finishing uh, residents is trauma critical care. And, and probably behind that is general surgery. Uh, this is the legacy of, uh, of David Richardson uh, and around the country, I, I can see this interest in, in trauma and critical care as a career is uh, something that, that certainly Dr. Richardson had a lot to do with. Uh, next up is Dr. Eddie Carrillo, also with roots to our program, who's uh, got some comments and we'll talk about some issues related to hepatic trauma. Dr. Carrillo, I see you there, welcome. Good morning, Kelly, and uh, thank you for 
this uh, great opportunity to be here with uh, everyone celebrating the life and career of Dr. Richardson. First, I would like to extend my condolences to the Richardson family, as well as to all members of the Department of Surgery at the University of Louisville. Uh, and I'm briefly, I'm gonna share some of the highlights of the article that is behind this invitation. But more than anything else, I would like to share the uh, very unique relationship that I had with Dr. Richardson for over 40 years. So I hope that you all can uh, see my screen at this point. And, uh, and again, I wanna emphasize that the more than talk about the article, I really would like to talk about the uh, life and career and my personal relationship with Dr. Richardson. First, let me just uh, briefly give a little background. Uh, the University of Louisville had have and uh, an amazing experience uh, about publishing about liver injuries for several years before even I came to University of Louisville. Some publications became classics and, and are commonly quoted up to, to, up to this date in multiple trauma meetings. There are more than 50 publications in surgical journals, in bite reviews and book chapters. And Dr. Richardson clearly had a very unique uh, interest in this field. So, Dr. Richardson was able to identify early in the 90s and mid-1990s uh, that there was a major transition in the management of liver injuries. Uh, this was the result of a better understanding of the pathophysiology of liver injuries. There was also a growing quality and availability of amazing uh, diagnostic technology. And also there was a growing frustration with the oversensitivity of diagnostic peritoneal lavage. So at some point in the... Uh, 1990s, mid-90s, when I came back to Louisville from New York to Miami, he asked me to come to his office to talk about projects and things that I probably should be involved doing during my tenure as a um, member of the faculty. So he said, let's look about what's happening to this transition about blood liver injuries. And he pretty much said, let's see what happens if this uh, treatment is uh, successful or not, and then try to identify some common complications that we're seeing that we never saw before. So that's how this paper came about. And he came with the title that he described as interventional techniques that are useful adjuncts in the non-op management of hepatic injuries. Now, this is way before we were talking about interventional techniques or interventional radiology. There was no such a thing back in the 90s. So Dr. Richardson and other members of the, uh, of the faculty, especially Dave Spain and Dr. Miller and myself, put together some of this data that was presented in the WST meeting in Baltimore in 1998 and then published in the Journal of Trauma the year after. I won't spend too much time talking about this, but suffice to say that some of the predictions that Dr. Richardson made even before we came with the data turned to be completely accurate 25 years later. First of all, we found that 76% of the um, patients were successfully managed in a non-operative manner. This is for patients with grade three and grade five, grade five liver injuries. And I can tell you that I remember the last time I took a patient to the OR with a liver injury. We also identified that yes, 24% of the patients were going to develop complications. However, the success rate of dealing with these complications in by minimal invasive techniques was 84%. Today, probably over 95% of patients are managed in a non-operative uh, manner in patients with complex liver injuries, and the success rate of the interventional uh, procedures are probably close to 100%. In that meeting, we also brought some very unique uh, uh, pictures of what we were doing in Louisville at that time. Uh, Dr. Richardson made the point, or told me to make the point to emphasize that computer tomography was continued to evolve to the point that we we're gonna be able to grade liver injuries very accurately, which we have, that we're gonna be able to uh, quantitate hemoperitoneum and diagnose active hemorrhage to make decisions, which we have, by the way, and also to be able to define our anatomical structures. And clearly, computer tomography had become a uh, diagnostic tool for the overall management of this patient. We have to go back and remember that Back in the 90s, when this idea were coming into place, a fast CT scanner was able to do eight to 16 slides per minute, whereas today, in any level one trauma center in the United States, most 
high-speed scanner do four to six slides per second. Somehow Dr. Richard was already thinking that this was gonna be the trend in the diagnosis and treatment of these patients. We also mentioned that, yes, there were complications that could be managed by interventional techniques. Now that we have in every major program organized interventional radiology service, services that, as I mentioned before, were non-existent at that time. We also show some of the experience in Louisville led by Drs. Larson and Vitali regarding the uh, increasing role of uh, uh, endoscopic surgery in the management of some of these complications. We also talk about the value of computer tomography in diagnosis intrahepatic vascular injuries. This is the very first case that I, uh, I'm aware that happened at the University of Louisville in 1995, where the patient was diagnosed by CT scan with hemobilia, was taken to interventional radiology, or radiology, as it was called back in those days, where the diagnosis was made by angiography, and the problem was resolved by um, uh, transcatheter embolization of the pseudoaneurysm in the liver. We also brought some of the experience that we had had with biliovenous fistula. This is a patient with a bilioportal fistula that was managed by endoscopy and, uh, and endostentin. And we also brought our experience about uh, bioperitonitis and the sepsis-like syndrome seen commonly in these patients. Another point that Dr. Richardson made when I started my tenure in Louisville was to uh, be able to capture all of this data and be able to publish and present and uh, I didn't know that I had that ability uh, until he kept uh, enticing me to do it. And it was truly fascinating to see how a lot of these ideas became real projects. Time was by and we kept working on this and thank you to the support of Dr. Polk, where he uh, secured some funding and space in his lab. We were able to show that the combination of hemoglobin, uh, of hemoglobin and bile had a dose-like fashion effect in these patients, and that was the result of the sepsis-like sy syndrome seen in patients with bile peritonitis. Uh, this data was going to be presented at a meeting in Seattle in 2001. Unfortunately, due to the events of September 11, the meeting was canceled, but somehow we were able to publish our data uh, anyhow. So we were able to make some strong recommendations saying non-operative management will become the standard of care complications can be and are expected in patients with injuries grade three to five. Uh, we also emphasize that the angiography will become the definitive management of many things happening in this patient with liver injuries. And also uh, emphasize the growing role of endoscopic surgery uh, for the treatment of some of these complications. And we also describe the technique of laparoscopic washout for the treatment of patients with bile peritonitis. Uh, and then we close by stating that this will become the standard of care in the years to come. Now, the, after the presentation, there was a very uh, animated discussion, but a discussion, which is very uncommon to allow that many people to comment on a paper. Some of the discussions were very supportive, but most of them were very antagonistic and critical of our data and our presentations. As I was sitting next to Dr. Richardson, I was really hesitant to go back to that podium and address some of those questions but I was able to see that he was really enjoying everything that we were talking about. Somehow two well-known and recognized trauma surgeons came to our rescue. One of them was Dr. Gil Cryer, one of ours, of course, who stated that what we're, the reason why we're seeing all of these complications is because we're not treating patients that historically would have died in the OR due to exsanguination. So he was very complimentary and supportive of the thing that we were doing. And then Dr. Thomas Scalia, uh, who was kind of the host of the meeting in Baltimore, stated that this work represents another step in the management and the non-operative management and expand our choices in the sequential application of these techniques. Of course, Dr. Scalia was somehow biased because of his work with Dr. Sclafania, Kings County, New York, where clearly there were some of the pioneers in the role of interventional radiology as an adjunct in trauma care. Later on, Dr. Richardson informed me that this paper was the runner-up for the Canisaro Award for the uh, best paper for a new member. Uh, the good news is that our recognition with, went to Dr. David Spain from our unit with another paper uh, from Louisville as well. So 25 years later, Dr. Feliciano asked me to do a review of this article, and he never told me the reason why, but I suspect that uh, in his files looking for paper, he found this uh, article that clearly defined the foresight and vision of Dr. Richardson, where 20 years before, uh, he clearly stated, uh, and he clearly helped me to 
do this presentation, stating that this was going to be the standard of care as time went by. Rather than talk about much about the paper, I would like to talk a little bit about the very unique and personal relationship that I have with Dr. Richardson. I start by saying that this article also could be uh, titled A Historical Vignette of Dr. J. David Richardson, a horseman, a mentor, a friend, and the ultimate academic surgeon. I was somehow surprised that Dr. Richardson uh, didn't call after this paper was, or this uh, uh, um, edition of the American Surgeon was published. And as Dr. Feliciano explained, somehow he wasn't aware. But somehow in June of this year, he called me and he was very uh, grateful. And he said, you know what? I don't know how you came with that title, but that's exactly the way that I feel about my life. I went on to say that I first met Dr. Richardson in the summer of 1980 at the Old Louisville General Hospital as I was working as a research fellow for Dr. Flint and Dr. Polk. He came to me, stretched his hand, and introduced himself, and that was the beginning of a lifetime relationship and a friendship. As time went by, I brought my very pregnant wife to his office one day and said, Dr. Richardson, I want you to help me to secure a position here as a resident. And with the blessing of Dr. Polk, I became a surgical resident at the University of Louisville, which, as I tell everyone, was the best and the happiest day of my life. Time went by, I had to know Dr. Richardson in his role as a horseman. I didn't know much about horses, but somehow through our meetings and our conversations, I got to know a little bit about what exactly he meant when he said, I'm a horseman. Also, I met him on several occasions here in Southern Florida, in South Florida when he came for the Florida Derby. And I was able to appreciate how much he enjoyed his time in the races, how well recognized he was by everyone. And it was truly a unique experience for me. We have shared some of those pictures with some of the members of the uh, Department of Surgery, but this picture is a reflection of Dr. Richardson in his office. Uh, those meetings that happened in his office were with no agenda. It was just a flow of ideas back and forth where we talk about family, we talk about friends, we talk about patients, we talk about projects, and it was not uncommon that Dr. Richardson talked about the upcoming races, and depending on the time of the year, he talked about his beloved uh, Kentucky Wildcats. And many times he brought to my attention and whoever was in the room about this very unique situation that happened in March 28, 1992, where uh, Kentucky was playing Duke for the East Regional Final. And he used to say, we were 103 to 102 with 2.1 seconds left. And then Christian Layden, who had no business to be in, the, in that game, threw that shot that was here across uh, Kentucky, except for Jefferson County, I guess. But uh, it was clearly. A, 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 an event that uh, Dr. Richardson really talked about. And uh, until recently, when I had the chance to review some of these uh, old movies and stories, I was able to appreciate why he was so upset about the whole thing. But that was Dr. Richardson in those meetings, talking about a lot, of, a lot of things. But then at the end, he became very introspect, very quiet, very serious, got whatever papers I had in my hand, grabbed that uh, beautiful black, uh, mont black pen out of his uh, chest pocket, and start making notations on the papers, uh, making recommendations, changing the title, challenging some of the uh, numbers and data that were pre presented to him. And it is clear to me that many of those papers became, became significantly better because of his editorship at that time. I had a chance to travel with Dr. Richardson to many meetings to present our data, to present our publication. As a matter of fact, uh, during my tenure in Louisville, Dr. Richardson, myself, and the other members of the program were able to uh, present and, and, and publish over 45 articles, book chapters, and other things. Clearly nothing like that would have happened had not been for his mentorship. I also knew Dr. Richardson as a local and national leader. Some of the, the uh, prior speakers have also addressed this, but I was fascinated to see the, the, the fights that he took, the, the problems that he presented, and the way to address them. However, this is nothing new. Back in 1995 was a very uncommon and um, violent summer in Louisville, which I think nothing has changed very much in the last few years, to be honest. And he had an impromptu press conference outside the main entrance of the Universal Louisville Hospital on Jackson Street, where he was talking about shortages, uh, decreasing the uh, budget, and all the challenges that we had to deal with in the trauma program. And some of those comments and some of those observations made it to the Sunday edition of the, of the Courier Journal uh, that summer. 
As mentioned before, Dr. Richard was a leader in the American College of Surgeons, became a member in 1980 and president in 2015. But throughout the years, he truly was a leader of major uh, committees and other um, initiatives in the college. He also was a leader in academic surgery, member of many organizations, and there is no question that his membership in the Southern Surgical Association was very special to him. I became a member due to his uh, uh, support and encouragement, and I truly look forward to the meeting in South Florida every year to have the chance to see him and, and spend some time with him. So I also described Dr. Richardson as the ultimate academic surgeon. I didn't know exactly why I came with that description until I read this article by Dr. Uh, Todd Rosengard from Baylor in Houston, where he stated that a true academic surgeon is anyone who contributes to intellectual life of a department or the discipline of surgery in a serious and systematic way. And I think that this pretty much summarizes what Dr. Richardson was for the Department of Surgery at the University of Louisville. As described by Dr. Spain, Dr. Richardson was a friend for life. I mean, those of us who enjoy his time in the OR that came to the rescue of us and patients many times, I had the great pleasure to have him and Dr. Polk in the privacy of my house to enjoy ourselves during social events. But also Dr. Richardson was there for those times when we were uh, at the lowest of our lives, when we were suffering, when we were looking for advice, for friendship and support. As a matter of fact, when I share with my 92-year-old mother the passing of Dr. Richardson, uh, she said, oh my gosh, what are you going to do now? He was your consigliere, who in the words of her ancestors means someone that is there for you to provide advice, to provide support, to listen, but also when there is no need to put a good fight for you. And that's what Dr. Richardson was for me. So as I sit today in the uh, privacy of my office here in Hollywood, Florida, I see there is a bunch of diplomas, plaques, and other things on the walls, and things that come with time, as well as, as we move uh, in our uh, leadership roles in our careers. And then I realized that nothing would have happened had not been for Dr. Richardson, and that amazing opportunity he, came, he gave me to come uh, to Louisville and became a, a fellow and a, and a resident. Uh, when I think about Kentucky, I think about the Derby, and I think about Dr. Richardson, I think about that amazing brunch in his house on Derby Day. Many times I think about the stories that he shared with me about his hometown of Moorhead, Kentucky. But the thing that I remember the most about Dr. Richardson at the time that we spent talking about patients, talking about projects, and doing the things that we did as partners and as friends. So I want to thank Dr. Mike Masters and Dr. Paul for this kind invitation, and also to recognize Dr. Feliciano for been able to pick a paper that clearly, in my view, reflect the vision and foresight of Dr. Richardson. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrillo. Next, uh, Dr. Nicole Stassen is here in person and going to give some of her reflections in the context of transmediastinal gunshot wounds, a topic when I was ever on trauma call, I always called David Richardson about. I can say it's daunting to be two things. One, the last thing that stands between you all is food, which is never a, a good thing. Um, but also, you know, when um, Dr. McMaster sent the invitation to talk, you know, I knew it was only because of Dr. Feliciano and him inviting me to write um, the review in the FETRIF that I was included amongst the hallowed speakers we've already heard. Um, for me, um, I've known Dr. Richardson the shortest of all the speakers, and that's still 20 years. Um, who I am as a surgeon, who I am as a parent, who I am as a human has a lot to do with the gentleman we're celebrating today. My slides are going to come up in a minute, um, but I can't even describe um, how much his loss affected all of us. And to his family, I can't even imagine. The last conversation that he and I had was back in May um, with regards to the Fed shift, and we'll get to that towards the end of the talk. Um, are we good? All right, we're good. Now I can, I can stop being emotional and just talk. So my talk went, there it is. So like I said, you know, being a part of this um, is an incredibly humbling experience. Um, as somebody who still feels very junior, even though 
been a full professor since 2017. Um, oh, he's taking control. Excellent. So um, this is my old talk. Anyway, um, Dr. Richardson never would have had PowerPoint slides that he changed the night before because he just didn't think it was good enough because he just wasn't that type of person. Um, but I have nothing to disclose except for what I just said. You know, his loss hit, hit us hard and the world's not going to be the same without him. Next slide. So there's a quote by Robert Kennedy that there's those who look at things the way they are and ask why, and that he dreamt of things that never were and asked why not. And really Dr. Richardson approached everything in trauma and patient care with that in mind. Next slide. So um, Dr. Livingston, and um, as we were sitting here, we realized that there's Dr. Richardson, David, Dr. Spain, David, and Dr. Livingston, David, all three presidents of the AAST, fairly confident the only three all named David with roots in the same institution to be president of that organization. But for the 75th anniversary of the AAST, um, Dr. Livingston was tasked with interviewing all of the past presidents. And what Dr. Richardson said was that the best career advice he had was to be an academic surgeon was that you had to do three things. First, write at least two papers a year. Second, you should try to get on the operating room schedule every day so that people will know that you're a real surgeon. And third, have an exciting hobby that it takes you away from things. I would add a fourth, since there was no conversation that you had with Dr. Richardson where he didn't stress that your family was the foundation of everything you did. Next slide, please. So, I was fortunate enough to be able to write this manuscript with Dr. Richardson, and much like Dr. Spain and Carrillo and everyone else before me, he got called to his office and you know, I go, oh my goodness, golly gumdrops, why? Um, and we were discussing um, things that, that we had done along the, the way and other projects that we'd worked on when I was a fellow, and that he had this, this new great idea and maybe I should pursue it that you were voluntold. Next slide, please. So this really was a reevaluation of his sentinel work. He and um, Lou Flint, who you heard from before, wrote the original uh, description of the gold standard workup for the trans patient with a transmitted sentinel gunshot wound back in 1981. I was still in junior high then. So the gold standard had been arch aortography, esophagoscopy, esophagram, bronchoscopy, and a pericardial window. Next slide, please. Problems with this evaluation was that it was really time consuming, it was expensive, there's a bunch of associated morbidity with it, and it was pretty low yield. Next slide, please. And what was happening over the course of the 90s, and again, you know, this paper was undertaken in, the, in 2000, was that contrast-enhanced CAT scan was really becoming much more readily available. As you just heard from Dr. Carrillo, you went from having a four-slice scanner where maybe you could see one picture of a brain in 15 minutes to much more um, efficient technology, and that was much more sensitive for identifying injuries. The light bulb went off, well, for me, much more delayed than for Dr. Richardson. But could we somehow harness this technology and improve the way we take care of patients with transmediastinal gunshot wounds? Next slide, please. So a new institutional algorithm was developed where if you were unstable with a transmediastinal gunshot wound, you went directly to the operating room. If you were stable, you had a CT scan of the chest and you had a pericardial ultrasound done. Now. Dr. Feliciano's wife, Dr. Rosicki, we wouldn't have pericardial ultrasound without her. But if that was positive, you went to the operating room again. Next slide, please. So one thing I learned, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so one thing I learned in Louisville is you don't animate slides. You just add your parts and then you make other slides. So, because animation sometimes doesn't work. So. That's why next slide. So if your pericardial ultrasound was negative, um, I didn't mean that next slide, sorry. <laughs> so if your pericardial ultrasound was negative, you then underwent a helical CT scan of your chest. And what that allowed, and what the hypothesis was, was that that was gonna give you a directed further evaluation. So you didn't have to do that trifecta of material. Real next slide, please. 
So the study hypothesis was whether helical CT scan was an effective diagnostics tool for the evaluation of a patient with a transmediastinal gunshot wound. Next slide, please. One thing he did stress when I was in his office that day was to make sure it wasn't a, in quotations, so what paper. What I find when I'm at any academic meeting, that goes through my head all the time. So what? What can you do with this paper? So what? Can you take anything away from it? Is it going to change what you do? So what? So there was definitely some pressure on to make sure this was not another so what paper. Next slide, please. We studied all the individuals with, that were hemodynamically stable with transmediastinal gunshot wounds at the University Hospital in Louisville. And a positive CT scan, was con it was considered positive if they had mediastinal hematoma, pneumomediastinum, or there was any proximity of that missile tract to the mediastinal structures. Next slide, please. They were all male, 33 years old, a little older than what we might expect for our trauma population. The majority had single gunshot wounds, but 22% had multiple, and one had the dreaded shotgun wound, 8 million pellets everywhere, including the mediastinum. Next slide, please. What we found is that only 32% had a positive CT scan. And of that directed further evaluation, nobody needed that entire workup that had been espoused for the two decades prior. Next slide, please. 68% had a negative CT scan and no further studies needed to be done. They are followed clinically. There were no missed injuries. And we, the average decreased hospital charge was over $2,000. Next slide, please. Only 9% required operative intervention. One was a subclavian artery laceration, which had a, a repair via a supernatural inferior clavicular approach. Dr. Polk, I apologize. I had changed this slide. You used to have lab meetings where you couldn't present anything, and you would give him a typo on the first slide, so he would feel he'd done his job. So this was unintentional, but reminiscent of many lab meetings here. The other patient had a tracheal injury that was repaired through a collar incision. Next slide, please. So what we concluded was that you could use contrast helical CT. It was safe and reliable, and it was a, a diagnostic tool for patients with transmediastinal gunshot wounds. It decreased unnecessary procedures and decreased cost. Next slide, please. So what? What did it mean? Next slide. For trauma patients, it was a proof of concept. It changed the paradigm in management for transmediastinal gunshot wounds, and you won't find anyone doing that classic workup without some form of screening intervention anymore. It also ex was allowed for the expansion of use of imaging for other truncal penetrating injuries. Next slide. For me, it was the first abstract to it that was submitted to a meeting. Next slide. All of us will remember they weren't electronically given. You had to calculate when you had to FedEx your paper abstract into the meeting to make sure we get there on time. And I'm sure that Dr. Flanken will remember when he was a fellow also, because he taught me how to do this, you measured the eight and a half by 11 piece of paper to make sure your text box was exactly the size that it would be. So when you printed your abstract, it went perfectly. At least I guess we didn't have to hand type them. We could still use a computer. Next slide, please. It was also the first project I ever had accepted for a WSD podium presentation. Next slide. And next slide. It was also my first journal of trauma publication. Next slide. Next slide. It was supposed to be my first WST meeting as a presenter. Next slide. None of us could have predicted that spring what would happen that September. I was on trauma call that day and actually in what I assume is still the fellow's office in the hallway outside of the Department of Surgery, putting the slides together for this talk. It was the last AAST meeting where you had to bring 35 millimeter slides in addition to your electronic talk. We were unsure if the meeting would still happen and most of the department spent half the day walking through the main hallway of the department where there was a tube 13 inch television set up in front of the main desk when you came into the department with updates. We didn't know what was going on. We cleared our burn unit, we cleared our trauma unit, but they were never needed. Next slide, please. The meeting was supposed to be September 13th through 15th, and certainly taking all the trauma surgeons out of their home institutions just a few days after the horrible events of September 11th was not in the best interest of the country. The meeting was canceled, and it was the only time since World War II. The manuscripts were still published in the Journal of Trauma with the inclusion of the discussion, discussant comments. Next slide. 
the figure from our paper was the cover article, cover figure for the Journal of Trauma for the AAST meeting for that edition. Next slide. As fellows, we didn't get the Journal of Trauma in print, so as you'll notice, mine was generously bequeathed by Dr. Polk. You can see his writing in the bottom. Next slide. To this day, that journal hangs on my wall in my office, directly across from my desk, where it inspires me every day. Next slide. That manuscript and that article really started me on my road to academic surgery and really starting here in Louisville allowed me to be off to the races. Next slide, please. Dr. Livingston also asked Dr. Richardson what the most rewarding parts of his career were. And what he said was that resident fellow education and helping them in the, their careers was the most rewarding. He said that there was a saying, you drop a pebble in the water and you just don't know how far those ripples will go. I believe in that. Next slide. Certainly, I never would have gotten to where I am in my career. I never would have been the president of the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma. Next slide. Without the foundation that was built for me here at the University of Louisville and the support of that Louisville family ever since. Next slide. So there's a session at the East meeting um, called the Orion's Award. And the Orion's Award is a resident and fellow essay competition about why they want to pursue what we do. And there's a keynote address. And there was only one person in my mind that can make that keynote address my presidential year. That person's supposed to be someone who's a light, a guide for all those who come, come after them. And the only choice for me was Dr. Richardson. Next slide. He was asked what his worst career advice ever was. He said that it was when he was told to specialize and that you couldn't be so broadly focused. And I can hear his voice almost saying, well, and as you know, I never did take that advice. It may be good advice, I just never took it. Next slide. Because he really felt that you had to do in your heart what you felt was right, because you'd be criticized anyway, and you'd be damned if you did and damned if you don't. And this may have been Eleanor Roosevelt, but it should have been J. David Richardson who said that. Next slide. He also asked what we thought were the biggest advances in trauma care, and what he said was advances in critical care, the concept of damage control, and the advancement in imaging. Next slide. These are just a few representative papers of what Dr. Richardson wrote while I was a fellow here. Every single topic he talked about is touched in these manuscripts, and that's just a two-year snapshot, and these aren't even all of them from that time frame. Next slide, please. One of the last communications I had with Dr. Richardson was about the FET shift. He, much like Dr. Feliciano, the, the email Dr. Feliciano got, he told me he opened a box and he wasn't really expecting it, but how he is so touched with the kindness that people showed that he remembered the anecdote I used. The first time I met Dr. Richardson was at the 1999 AAST meeting. He was the president of the AAST at the time, and I was a chief resident. I had just accepted um, the fellowship position here at the University of Louisville. I wasn't even going to start until the following July, um, but he included me in the Louisville family like I already belonged. Um, the meeting was in Boston, and um, my parents um, came to pick me up because they lived in Boston at the time, and we're at the, um, the presidential banquet, and he says, uh, I'm like, you know, sir, I have to go. My parents are here to get me. He's like, well, why do you have to go? Just bring them in. So mind you, the, um, the WC banquet is black tie. So there are my parents in basically khakis and a polo shirt coming on in to the AAST banquet. So, you know, I introduced my parents. He's like, we're so glad that she's going to be joining us. I'm like, man doesn't even know me. Like, he never met me. He was out of town when I interviewed. Oh, my stars. Um, and uh, he's like, well, they should just go dance. Glenn will remember this because someone came up to him and said, who are those people dancing in regular clothes? To which Dr. Richard replied, they're our new trauma fellows' parents. You should go say hi. Next slide, please. Whenever he communicated with you, he asked about your family. He knew the names of my kids. There must be thousands of children that he knows. Thousands. But he would ask. And both of my parents passed away this year. 
And um, he commented on that and said he couldn't imagine how that felt. So he was delighted to hear about what was going on with my kids. When um, my sister lived in Cincinnati, after I'd left to go to the University of Rochester, we used to come back to Louisville to say, hey, and I would bring the kids with me. So I have pictures of my kids as toddlers run in the hallways outside of the department. He closed that, you know, if he could ever be of assistance, to just call. And that's something you just knew. If he needed him, he'd pick up the phone. And so he somehow, you know, he sent, um, excuse me, he sent that original email about 10 days after my father passed. So in my mind, he just knew. He knew that I needed to talk to somebody. So, next slide, please. All of us in this room are blessed to have been touched in some way by Dr. Richardson, as well as, and I mean this room, the humans on the screen. He was an amazing surgeon. No one will doubt that. He wrote a million papers and influenced everything that we do in our field at this time. But he was a full rounded human and insisted that those that were around him were the same. Next slide, please. We started with a quote from Robert Kennedy and we'll close the same way. Robert Kennedy said that few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events, and in total, all of those acts will be written in the history of this generation. Dr. Richardson absolutely was one of those few who had the greatness to bend surgery in the way that it needed to go. He had the foresight, the clairvoyance, to address issues we didn't even know were coming. And it's incumbent on all of us to continue to change things, even in small ways, so that his history will be continued to be written on all generations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stassen. Well, we're uh, a little bit into overtime now, and before we all start crying and and thinking about it too much, I'm going to have to bring this program to a close. It's been wonderful, and thanks to all of you for participating. Many are those who look at their lives and wonder whether you've made any kind of meaningful contribution or made any kind of difference in this world. And uh, what you just heard was Dr. Richardson's difference that he made in this world. The lives of many, many people, patients, students, residents, fellows, faculty members, colleagues, family, friends. He made a tremendous difference in this world, and it was all for the good. So I'll bring it to a close with that. Thank you.